Great. Thank you guys for coming early. Uh, I'm going to start pretty much right off because we have a lot of you and a lot of good projects to get through. <clears throat> if you, um, just one logistical note, I'll tell you, uh, I hoped it was clear. We said if your video was public, that's, where, that's in the queue right now. If it's unlisted, that means you don't want me to show it today. I think a bunch of people, based on emails you've sent in the last 20 minutes, <laughs> might have marked your video unlisted and expected that to be shown today. By default, that's not happening. You could talk to Bojan and we see, see if we can figure it out. Um, yeah, talk to me in here and if you have to have a I have queued up all of the videos marked public and we're going to play them. And I've got, because we have so many of them, and uh, it's kind of nice actually, I can just tell YouTube to play at exactly the allotted time and it stops. <laughs> and every once in a while, there's going to be one that's like about to show the results. And then it stops. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not a bad guy. I just automatically, I programmed the embedded URLs to, to, to do this, OK? OK, so thank you guys for all the hard work. And uh, without further ado, let's, let's start. Oh, we have to figure out. Yeah. We modeled everything in a simulator with physics, like gravity. And you know what? How am I going to get you to hear the audio well up there? That's something we haven't worried about too much before. Hmm. I don't think this is actually making it louder up, up in the room, is it? Oh. This is... Uh, not exactly the high tech I was hoping for, but I'm going to put the mic kind of close to the computer. We'll see how that goes. Yes, there's also this one. You think there's one here? Maybe not the front here. That doesn't look promising. It's on the PC. There's a microphone set up. Audio. If you go into the system settings on your MacBook, you get the option to output the full speaker. as well as the limitations of the robot to achieve the perpetual juggling motion. With some additional work, we could even load this program onto a real Ewa robot and have it juggle uh -huh. in real life. Nice. <laughs> to start, we need to choose century. the point at which we are going to throw and catch. The per uh, to start, we need to choose the point. point at which we are going to throw and catch. The per that juggles. We modeled everything in the simulator with physics, like gravity and friction, as well as the limitations of the robot to achieve the perpetual juggling motion. With some additional work, we could even load this program onto a real Ewa robot and have it juggle in real life. To start, we need to choose a point at which we are going to throw and catch. The approach we use to find such two positions is forward kinematics. We first decide on a set of comfortable joint angles of Ewa, and then calculate the corresponding spatial position of the gripper. So now that we have our throw and catch positions and their comfortable joint configurations, we'll use a formula of projectile motions to calculate the start and end velocity given the max height of the trajectory. We also want to get corresponding joint velocities. We first calculate the Jacobian matrix for translational velocities at the joint configuration. By multiplying the pseudo universe of Jacobian with the spatial velocities, we're able to obtain the joint velocity for both catch and throw. And now it's time for the cool part. How do we get our robot to go from being here with this velocity to here with this velocity at exactly 0 0.639 seconds later? We can frame this as an optimization problem. We want to minimize the length of the path subject to the following constraints. First, we constrain the positions and velocities at the throw and catch points. Second, the entire duration of the arm trajectory needs to be exactly the duration the ball is in the air for. And third, we ensure that the joints on the Ewa robot don't exceed their position, velocity, or acceleration limits. At this point, we've done a lot of the groundwork. We're super excited. We put it on our robot, and this is what we see. Everything is going great. Then it lets go of the ball at completely the wrong position with the wrong velocity. Graphing the desired positions and velocities, 
as well as the measured positions and velocities, we see that the measured values lag behind the desired values by 0.0538 seconds. Originally, we were sending our desired positions to a system that interpolates the desired state with discrete derivatives. The desired state is then fed into the inverse dynamics controller, which spits out the force commands to send to the arm. Note that this system doesn't feed desired acceleration to the inverse dynamics controller at all. To improve tracking, we removed the state interpolator and took analytical derivatives on our position trajectory to get our desired velocities and accelerations and fed those into the inverse dynamics controller directly. We can see that with these changes, the measured values now converge to the desired values. We put our new controller on the robot, but somehow it is still not able to catch the ball. Gripper is trying to catch the ball where we thought it was going to be instead of where it, it actually is. To account for this, we need to change our planner so that it updates the trajectory based on the actual position and velocity of throwing right after releasing the ball. We put this on the robot, and after some debugging, finally it works! We tried a bunch of different heights and found that it can juggle up to 2 meters high. To make the jump to juggling multiple balls, we had to modify our planner. When trying to juggle two balls, after throwing the first ball, you have to catch and throw the second ball all in the time that the first ball is in the air, so we have much less time to move between the throw and catch positions. We can keep most of our planner exactly the same, but after a ball is thrown, instead of replanning the trajectory based on the ball you just threw, we update it with the position and velocity of the ball that we want to catch, and this is what it looks like. One thing we had to do was to warm start the arm with the desired joint velocities at time zero, because unlike in the one ball case, it didn't have enough time for the actual velocities to converge on the desired velocities before it had to throw the ball. Next, we tried juggling three balls, but kept running into the problem of the balls colliding in the air with each other, because now there are two balls in the air at the same time, and because of the slight inaccuracies in the throw. We were about to give up when we decided to try making the ball smaller, and it worked. On one hand, this feels a bit like cheating, but on the other hand, it's also cool because our controller is precise enough to juggle something so small. This was the limit though. The kinematic trajectory optimization kept failing when we tried to juggle four balls. And finally, to put it on the real robot, we need a perception system. In the simulator, we can always know the exact position and velocity of everything, but in the real world, we'll need to find a way to measure that. We simulated three Intel RealSense depth cameras, where we plan to combine the point cloud from each camera, then subtract the gripper from the point cloud. By best fitting a sphere to the leftover point cloud, we would be able to estimate the center position of the ball from the fitted sphere, where we would then be able to feed the position to the kinematic. That's pretty good. That's, that's, I think uh, we talked about it a little bit in the manipulator control lecture, but that's a, a beautiful way to get nice tracking. Very nicely done. Okay, let's keep going. I do have a schedule on the, an optimistic schedule on the spreadsheet of like about when we think videos are going to come up. We'll see how it goes. Stage of extracting the point clouds from the cameras, but haven't yet been able to subtract the arm or fit the sphere. Hey everyone, our project is titled Implicit Neural Representations for Deformable Objects. Our fundamental aim has been trying to find a smarter way to model deformable objects. Ultimately, we could use these models to do downstream tasks like key point estimation. Key point estimation is difficult on deformable objects due to the many different deformation configurations. As we will show, generalized implicit neural representations are naturally invariant to object deformations since they rely on topological features of the object. What are implicit neural representations? INRs are functions that parameterize conventionally discrete signals, like the pixels of an image are points in a point cloud, and learn a continuous function that maps the domain of the signal. These functions are not dependent on the spatial resolution of the original signal, unlike standard ML models, which provide an estimate of each pixel within an image. 
The caveat is that most INRs are trained on data residing strictly in Euclidean space. So even though INRs learn functions that aren't dependent on spatial resolution, they are still tied to some Euclidean space. Modeling deformable objects means we can't be tied to this kind of space. Generalized INRs can be thought of as applying INRs in non-Euclidean domains. Given the assumption that a continuous signal exists on some unknown topological space, we can sample a discrete graph from the space. We then compute a spectral embedding for each node in the graph. This embedding allows us to approximate each node's location since there's no coordinate system. We can then use a neural net to learn the mappings between the spectral embedding of each node to some predict predicted signal. In our case, this part is a classification problem where we wish to output one of n labels per node. Here are the first three components of the computed GNR embeddings for the Stanford bunny. We see that the components vary smoothly over the bunny's surface. Because GNR embeddings only depend on the topology of an object, they are independent of a coordinate frame. Thus, we can use them for learning representations of deformable objects. Here, we investigate GNRs for key point prediction. Here is the Stanford bunny with a few key points labeled, corresponding to the right ear the right eye, and the tail. Our project seeks to answer the following key questions. Are GNR embeddings informative enough for key point prediction on objects? Can they generalize to unseen deformations of an object? And finally, can they generalize to undersampled slash oversampled mesh representations? Our experimental setup consists of manual labeling key points on an undeformed or canonical object of interest. Here, we choose the Stanford bunny with five classes of key points. Note that the number of labeled key points is much lesser than the number of total points in the mesh. We create deformations of the canonical bunny by simulating impact with the ground and manual deformation. Here is an animation showing the impact simulation of the bunny with the ground. To perform the simulation, we first tetralized the 2D surface mesh to get a 3D volume mesh and we then simulated it in PyDrake by dropping from the bunny from a height and recording the positions after impact. Once we have these deformations, we considered additional modifications, such as random addition of new points and edges, oversampling, or undersampling the resultant mesh. All of these modifications affect the underlying topology of the object. Next, we will present the results from our experiments. Here we show an example of the training data for the canonical bunny mesh with labeled points colored by their class. On the bottom, we will show an example deformation of the bunny with predicted classes. Notably, we found our model struggled with false positives, but was able to correctly classify all the labeled points. We also observed that once our model performed well on the training example, it achieved identical results on the deformed example, since their mesh structure was the same, which demonstrates the utility of GINR's inherent invariance to coordinate changes. Additionally, we evaluated how our model was able to classify key points when the meshes were modified. We perturbed the meshes by randomly adding 10% new vertices to the mesh. We trained our GINR using 15 sample meshes and evaluated it on 5. We saw that the GINRs do not require many examples to generalize well to perturb meshes, but having a smaller embedding size acted like a regularizer for our model. We also tested the ability of our model to generalize to oversampled and undersampled meshes. We trained our model on a single canonical example and observed that it was relatively robust to uniform oversampling, but significantly underperformed on undersampled meshes. We hypothesized that the undersampling has a greater influence on the spectral embeddings, leading to this erroneous behavior. In summary, we show that GINRs are useful for learning implicit representations on deformed objects due to their natural invariance properties. We see that they are able to generalize to some variations, but have improved robustness when trained on various mesh perturbations. In the future, we would like to extend the study by investigating how our model performs on meshes which are inferred from unstructured point cloud data. We foresee that these meshes will contain a greater degree of variability and would like to see how GINRs are able to perform under more naturalistic conditions. Lastly, we are interested in how we were able to use the topological structure of the mesh to register known object shapes onto partially observed data. Maybe I'll just ask a basic one. So <clears throat> instead of volumetric, you're, the, the spectral decomposition is, on, is a parameterizing the surface of the mesh, is that right? So how would it behave in, under a large deformation mode? Like would, it, would the, is that decomposition robust to really large changes in the, if you really squish the bunny? Um, yeah, but in our project, we kind of agree that we have the mesh structure already. Yep. Otherwise, we I see. Form, like, the surface of the structure is already there. I see. So the vertices are going to get you, the fact that you know where the vertices have deformed to already tells you the yeah, topology. It depends on the connection. It doesn't depend on like the number of points or like the actual coordinates. We can like expand it by 10 times. 
Awesome. Thank you. I'm leaving a little space for questions, if anybody has any. Okay, we have to keep going. That's great. Thank you. An essential aspect of human life is social interaction. In many cultures, it is common to interact with people physically via interactions such as high fives and fist bumps. As robots are becoming more integrated with human lives, there is an increased need for robots to become more human-like. That is, for humans to feel safer around robots and see robots more as human-like counterparts rather than these mechanistic machines that have no capacity for social interaction. However, there are many associated challenges with essentially humanizing a robotical system. In the first place, it's hard to describe what constitutes a human-like motion, but then it's also challenging to then translate those descriptions into raw code. Thus, we present HandBot. We are Miranda Kai, Jordan Wren, and Aaron Zhu, and today we will be presenting our final project called HandBot. HandBot is a simulation system that serves as a proof of concept to construct a basic human-like system without the use of learning, which is a contrast as many other systems use learning in trying to design human-like systems. Specifically, HandBot is a simulation that is able to recognize and respond to certain hand gestures, specifically high fives and fist bumps, using only the basics of perception and motion planning in an as human-like way as possible. HandBot has three main systems that allow it to respond to human gestures. First, the perception system of the robot will use a camera to get seen points of a hand or a fist that is floating in front of it, then use ICP to determine if it is a fist or not and its location in the world. Second, the robot will perform motion planning to set keyframes of where the robot hand should be. Finally, we use various controllers to control the robot and bring it to the target hand. When setting up our environment, we need to construct a robot that can effectively high-five or fist bump a floating hand. We opted to use the Allegro hand that is provided by Drake, as well as the Kuka Iwa 7 link arm. We then welded the hand onto the last joint of the Iwa arm. In addition, because the hand's configuration would not change after it matches the target hands, we fixed the hand joints on the robot arm such that it has no degrees of freedom. To further simplify our environment, we decided to keep it clutter-free, as perceiving objects in the scene and constraining motion planning would increase the time it takes for the robot to respond. And, in many cases, there are no obstructions in the way of the high five or fist bump. In order to identify which configuration the hand is in, as well as its location, we make use of ICP. In our initial iteration, we generated the model points by concatenating point clouds from multiple camera angles around the hand, getting the full model view of the hand or fist. However, since ICP tends to get stuck in local minima if the model points are not in a configuration similar to the scene points, we instead opted to generate model points from angles close to the front of the hand as seen on the figure in the left. This makes it so that the scene points almost always match the correct portion of the model points. We then obtain scene points from a camera next to the Iwa arm and perform ICP for both the fist and hand points. Whichever ICP error is the smallest gives us the hand configuration to use and the transform of the hand to approach. After learning the orientation and position of the target hand, we can construct the robot arm's planned trajectory by interpolating 10 frames between the robot's initial state and the desired final state. We decided to use a linear trajectory for simplification reasons, which worked well over the short distances being traveled to reach the target hand. Once we have this trajectory, the system will use a differential inverse kinematics controller to translate these poses into joint positions to execute the simulation. As you can see, we have designed a robotic system that is able to respond to human gestures like high fives and fist bumps. However, while we attempted to create our system in an as human-like way as possible, we acknowledge that our system is far from being perfectly natural. While our system may not be perfect, the results do serve as a stepping stone for future work on related tasks. Presenters there, so. I just since people have come in now, let me just, yeah, quick, quick logistics, so I went through the spreadsheet you guys are awesome. You're like saying, I, I could be there between 3.30 and 3.33 or whatever. I'm like, wow. I, I did my best to sort of, I basically kept the order, but I shuffled people who said I can be here only until 
3.30 a little bit, and it's all in the spreadsheet now. We're going to go through it, and if you didn't, if you thought, if you marked yourself unlisted, but we're hoping to be shown here, you tell Boyan uh, quick, because uh, the plan was to just show the public videos. That was the way you tell us you want it to be shown. Oh, uh, I will do that from my phone while the next video is playing. And just one other you know, comment. I think um, there's people in the class that are like in their final year of the PhD on a, working on robotics, and there's people in the class that this is the first time they've ever touched robotics. So I think it's just appreciate the diversity of you know, what people have done, and uh, it's really awesome to see the whole spectrum of, of and I have just been uh, watching how much people how much effort people are putting in, how much learning they've done on that, on that part. So appreciate the whole spectrum with me. Hi, today we're presenting to you the Hanoi Iwa robot, which is a robot that can solve the Tower of Hanoi. My name is Ning Shan Ma. I'm Zi Tong Cheng. And we're two juniors studying computer science at the MIT EECS department. Today, we'll be going through four parts of our project. The first is introduction and problem definition. Basically, why should we care about this problem? Yeah, well, so simply to start, to help people in their daily lives, robots today must be able to make intelligent decisions while performing manipulation tasks. And Tower of Hanoi is a perfect example of challenging the robot both to reason cognitively and also to perform strategic motion planning. And finally, of course, to manipulate the object. Yeah, previously we've seen robots assisting in household tasks, as well as robots playing other intelligent puzzles such as Rubik's Cube or Jenga. So we thought of it, applying it to the Tower of Hanoi, which is another intellectual puzzle. And basically the Tower of Hanoi is a classic mathematical puzzle where the goal is to transport a stack of discs from one pet to the other, usually from the leftmost peg to the rightmost peg. And the constraints or the rules of this game are that you can only move one disc at a time and that no larger disc can be placed on top of a smaller disc. And we want to minimize the time or the, t the steps required for this task. And we'll be going through the approach or how we made the robot play the game. First, we had the um, the whole system set up in Drake, which is a simula uh, simulation environment from our class, where we represented the disk as box instances, and we represented the pegs as flat cylindrical bases. Um, and the robot arm we used is the KUKA LBR EWA arm. The second step, of course, is to design our algorithm, break it down, and finally develop it. So here is a basic flowchart of our program. We break it down mainly to three separate steps. The first is to use a recursive gener uh, generation algorithm for us to actually figure out what step to do to solve the Tower of Hanoi. The second is to import those steps into the robot gripper and the gri for the gripper to iterate through each step to move each disk from, uh, from target uh, to yeah, design location. And the th third step, of course, is to once each step is completed, as well as that once all steps are completed, we need to check for those conditions and tell the robot to stop because that's where we end the program. And during this process, we definitely run into some difficulties and challenges, which we'll talk about here. Well, first thing is that we figure out we cannot actually grab the disk from top. So what happens is that they might be just simply too large. So a simple solution, we decrease the size of the different disks. A second difficulty we ran into was with the geometry of the disk. So as you can see here in the demonstration, when they're all cylinders, the robot arm slips when it was grabbing the disk. And this is due to the anti polar grasp, which with like a curved surface, it's harder. So we change it to using boxes that it doesn't need to be specifically at the two diameter points. Right. And the third thing is that we figure out that because we are using time to keep track of our um, simulation, sometimes the same step, which should be only executed once, is executed repeatedly. So here, we, that's why we incorporate a checking condition to, to determine has the gripper got to the uh, beginning position? Has it got to the end position? If both yes, then we said this step is complete and we execute the step. And this is the moment that you've been waiting for. How well can our robot play the game? So as you can see here, this is a 15 times speeded up version of our robot playing the game. It actually manipulates pretty effectively. There's no waste of time. And also you can see the stacking is pretty accurate. And you can see at the end, all all pegs have been, all this have been transported from the leftmost peg to, peg to the rightmost peg. And since this is also a three layer uh, model, we can easily generalize, generalize it to higher layers. 
And some future words. So what areas can be improved about our robot? The first is perception. Right now, our robot is basically getting the information about location. Good. Very nice. Now, I remember I talked to you guys not too long ago, and the robot was barely moving. And then all of a sudden, it's doing the whole Tower of Hanoi. I thought that was like incredible how fast uh, that was good. Uh, I love it. I love it. Any questions? No? OK. In this project, we seek to enable a robotic arm to catch a free-flying spherical projectile using only an RGBD sensor and a bin welded to the robot's end effector. We study this problem because it is an example of time-constrained robotic manipulation. All perception, planning, and control must take place within the time of flight of the object. This is in stark contrast to many other manipulation tasks such as pick-and-place. This presents challenges in both perception and control, as we must localize the object in real time and plan an efficient catch motion in order to be successful. Our system is split into three phases. First, perception, where we localize the object. Then planning, where we select an interception point based on our estimated trajectory. Finally, control, where we execute the catch. To localize the object, we note that any two points in the RGBD point cloud must be equidistant from the object center. This constraint can be formulated as a quadratic optimization cost, and then, after summing this optimization cost over all pairs of points, we can use quadratic programming to find an optimal center. We find that the center is robust to noise typically present in modern-day RGBD sensors. Given multiple of these object poses, we can estimate trajectory by correcting for the quadratic term in the projectile motion equations and fitting a line to the corrected data points in order to predict the initial object position and velocity. To select an interception point, we simply take the closest point on the trajectory to the current bin position. By using inverse kinematics to command the bin to the interception point, we can already achieve limited success in the catching task, specifically when the object's arc is very high and slow moving. However, for fast moving projectiles, the object tends to either bounce out or roll out of the bin after impact. To correct for this, we introduce a compensation trajectory consisting of two parts. First, a linear path minimizing the relative motion between the projectile and the bin, and second, a tilt meant to prevent the object from rolling out of the bin. With the compensation trajectory, our system is able to adapt to varying object poses, velocities, and angles. However, our system is not perfect. The two primary failure modes are significant error in the, estima in the estimated pose of the object resulting in a complete miss. The next is IK failure during the compensation trajectory, which prevents us from compensating the object motion properly. To conclude, our system achieves reasonable success on the catching task and simulation. Future work could be done to improve both the robustness So did you solve IK, uh, you said you said IK from here to here, and then uh, did you like linearly interpolate between them? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Cool. No, it's good. You got it. I really love it. Yeah. Could you show more details on the simulation? Yeah. So basically, it's just to start a signal projection, which is so basically at a window of time around the projection point, you like linearize the trajectory of the projectile, and then solve the signal projection. Really good. Okay. This is a summary of my final project on planning prehensile pushing of a horizontal plane using rapidly expanding random trees and motion cones. Pushing is a deceptively complex task, and I chose to focus on a simplified case, pushing a predefined object in a horizontal plane with a point contact, i.e. pushing an object while it rests on the ground. We can split this task into two main steps developing a friction-aware planner that can find a series of feasible pushes that move a square block from its initial position to some desired goal, and implementing this trajectory on a simulated robot in order to evaluate performance. 
We limit the positions around the edge of a block at which a push can be applied to it. As we learned in class, a pusher at each of these locations can exert a force on the block that lies within a friction cone, determined by the coefficient of friction between the pusher and the block. If the pusher attempts to apply a force on the boundary of this cone, then it will slip. Motion cones can be viewed as an extension of friction cones. We use them to represent the set of possible twists that can be induced on an object by an external wrench. This diagram shows the general process for determining the motion cones for our particular task. In the case of pushing in the horizontal plane, the motion cone is composed of two wrenches, one from the pusher and one from the supporting surface, i.e. the ground. The pusher wrench can be found by transforming the set of feasible pushes to the block's own coordinate frame. The set of possible support wrenches can then be represented by an ellipsoidal approximation of a limit surface. The limit surface can be visualized as the capability of a ground to resist loads applied to the object. This is itself a product of friction between the ground and the object. In this video, we can see that the roll of tape doesn't move until the load being applied exceeds some threshold. This is indication of a support wrench resisting our efforts to move it. Once we have a set of possible pusher and support wrenches, we can combine them to find the direction of possible motions. In order for our block to move, we must apply a pusher wrench that respects the friction constraints, and this pusher wrench must be sufficient to overcome the corresponding support wrench. We can find the motions that result from this process through the vectors perpendicular to the limit surface at the locations where the pusher wrench intersects. The set of all of these possible vectors forms a motion cone, which we can finally represent in the world frame. Using motion cones to validate potential pushes, I successfully implemented a simple RRT planner. Note that due to the stochastic nature of this approach, there are occasions when the planner fails to find a valid path towards the goal. I introduced an acceptable tolerance of misalignment with the goal in order to improve the chances of finding a feasible trajectory. Trying to follow the planned trajectories in the simulator led to promising results. Due to the feed-forward nature of our controller, we observe an accumulation of error for longer trajectories. These errors result from inaccurate push-up positions. <laughs> Is there like a, some, some time we really must watch the last little bit? It's fine, but the double laser doesn't work. Oh. <laughs> Nice, okay. Well, that is a really nice, that, that paper that you built off of is a really nice example of planning with that contact that we didn't, we didn't have that lecture, but, uh, but for planning with uh, dynamic constraints of friction and everything like that, that's a really nice paper to build off of. Yeah, thanks, Cormac. Yeah. Okay, since we do have a few people that we have to add to my already full schedule, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna prioritize people that are in the room, right? So if, if we go and um, the presenter's not here, then we'll, we can come back if someone shows up, but, uh, but I'll, I think we should prioritize the people that are in the room, yeah? Okay, so. You go to the grocery store just to see a huge line. The alternative is self-checkout, but that comes with its own set of issues, like Cody faces over here. Please place the items on the screen and wait. Please wait for it. Why, what I do? Please place the item on the stand and wait. Please wait for an attendant. Oh, goodness. We wanted to make this a far better experience. I'm Sonia. And I'm Vishnu. And we create a checkout bot, a robot to automate the checkout process at grocery stores. Here's the scenario we envision. A shopper will fill their cart with items and push it right next to the robot. The robot will then pick up the items one by one, put them on the counter for scanning, and then finally pick up the scanned item and put them in the final cart for the shopper to push out of the store. Now, creating the simulation required us to create the models for several different items. And here we have the individual grocery items that we modeled ourselves. It's a box with packaging on most sides and then a QR code on the final side. And we repeated this process for several different grocery items. Lastly, we imported a model for a shopping cart like you can see on the right, to better create a feel of a shopping environment in our simulation. Now here's a video demo of our robot in action. It comes to this first shopping cart and it picks up each item one by one. So here we have Raisin Bran and it'll position it right in between these three cameras that you see at the top. It has the QR code on this side 
And here's a view that the camera sees where it says scan Raisin Bran, at which point it'll proceed to pick up the box again and deposit it in the final cart. Now, this was our robot working at real speed, but now we'll speed it up so you can see it scan the other objects as well. Here we have Eggo Waffles, where it repeats the process. And then here in the camera view, you'll be able to see scan Eggo Waffles when it recognized the QR code. And I'll just fast forward the video so that you can also see how it picks up the Cheerios over here, drops it on the counter, picks it up after scanning, and then lastly says scan Cheerios. Now, finally at the end, it'll out also output an itemized receipt of everything that it scanned, as well as its final price. Now I'll pass it over to Vishnu to talk more about the technical details. So in the control flow for a simulation, we had several points of emphasis. One was retrying based on mode of failure. Whether it was dropped from the, uh, while picking up from the counter or dropped from picking up from the shopper's cart, we have code to retry several times. And one of the main parts of our project was the scanning of the QR code. So as Sonia explained, we applied a QR code texture to each of the objects we created, and these are our Ruko QR codes. And we used OpenCV's library to be able to do both the detection and the identification of these codes. And we kept a mapping from codes to their object items, and we stored these items. We also had code to reset the robot angles when it got stuck, such as when it got stuck uh, by hitting the camera. And we had end of simulation behavior, such as generation of the receipt. And what we did is we took the information we stored from before, scanning the QR codes, and we generated an itemized receipt with the final total for the users. So in summary, we created a control flow for a checkout bot, and we had some effective methods for scanning the shopping items using OpenCV and Aruco QR codes. Future work would include speeding up the robot in transition, adding collision geometry to items such as the shopping cart, and using a more appropriate robot arm and gripper to deal with the more diverse set of items we would deal with in a grocery store. Thank you. How frustrating was that? It looked it was diff IK, you said, right? And anyway, I saw it go through itself a couple times and even went around itself. Was that a major bottleneck for you or did you power through it? And the kinematic reachability of the EWO was pretty limited to get into that. Yeah, so you had to kind of drop the cart. I love it. And I love the textureless shopper. <laughs> I couldn't read what it said in the banner. What did it say in the banner? Uh, French bread. <laughs> French bread. That's awesome. <laughs> so good. I have a question. No, of course, yeah. How, how did you know what is the offset of it? Like if we are in the same box? <laughs> oh man that's like the texture coordinates were different or something yeah. okay send that to me after we'll fix that <laughs>for our 4212 final project, we developed Tetris Bot, which is an end-to-end -end robotic system that plays Tetris. Um, the motivation behind developing Tetris Bot is that we've seen that the combination of unrealistic game elements that require complicated simulation and fine-grained pick-and-place is pretty rarely explored. And we choose Tetris in order to explore this because it satisfies both of these criteria. Um, things like row clearing and uh, piece teleportation require, um, like, complex simulation and at the same time we need highly precise manipulation in order for pieces to be placed um, pretty right next to each other and tetris um, has the potential to impact a lot of robotic games and interactive simulators such as things like connect Four, chess or jenga and as far as we're aware this is the first tetris playing robotic system that we've seen
And so as you've seen in this class, there is a wide range of projects being explored in the space of robotic manipulation. So we just wanted to highlight some that we felt also touched on some similar aspects as TetrisBot did. So as we mentioned, as we learned in class, we learned about the dishwasher loader robot, which we saw those aspects of object identification, graph determination, and trajectory optimization. Uh, in the shopping cart example, uh, along with the loca localization, there was also this aspect of optimal piece placement, which is very important in Tetris. And finally, looking at more of the gameplay side, you have Jenga with that adversarial uncertain gameplay, which is a very important part of Tetris as well. So here's a brief overview of the methodology of Tetris Bot. We first construct and teleport a random piece, and then we detect said piece using a convolutional neural network. We pass in um, whatever our detection algorithm uh, returns to the gameplay algorithm, which returns a rotation and a position. We transform that into board coordinates and then place that piece at the desired location, and then we update our board state if necessary. Going into a little bit more detail, in order to construct and teleport a new piece, we require a simulation loop, which is pretty crucial for this entire project. And that's because certain aspects of Tetris can't be simulated using things like the physics engine, which is what we've traditionally used in class so far. Um, things like being able to spawn a piece at a given location or replace every uh, piece once we put it on the board with a series of unit cubes in the same location to make things like line clearing easier are things that we can't do without breaking out of the simulation. Once we have that randomly generated piece, we use a convolutional neural network to detect which piece um, we've teleported in. And we use a mobile net CNN in order as like our base network. And we train a couple of layers on top of that to determine which of the seven pieces we've randomly generated. Once we figured out what piece we have, we can then use our gameplay algorithm, which will basically determine what the optimal position is to place that piece on the board. And that's using heuristics like the uh, uh, the height of the board after any line clears after that placement, or like the actual placement on the board of that piece, like how low that piece can go. And these are heuristics that are used by players that are playing Tetris, and we felt that they would be effective at teaching the robot how to play Tetris effectively. For the final two steps, we go a bit more into detail in the next two slides. So for picking and placing, we plan a trajectory for each piece. So what that does is it composes four key poses to construct this trajectory, which are the initial pose here, a grass pose, an intermediate pose, and finally a drop pose. The grass pose is fixed for all the pieces and is able to pick all of them up. And the drop pose incorporates information from the gameplay algorithm, which is the rotation of the piece, and the desired row and column to drop it in. After dropping the piece, we update the board state. So what that involves is populating cubes in the location of that piece. And also, if any rows are full, we clear that row. And in these images, we see that before and after of a row clear. Here's a demo of our Tetris bot in action. Um, we can see that we have a successful end-to-end -end simulation. Well, there's three of you. I, I get the wrong time. You guys get another minute. I'm sorry that row and in the here's a demo of our tetris bot in action um, we can see that we have a successful end-to-end -end grasping and placing of each block and each one lands where desired on the board we can see that all the pieces are being identified correctly and placed correctly and the gameplay is pretty reasonable yeah and so uh, as you're working on this project, there were a couple of extensions that we were thinking about. So, you know, obviously we want to make a more robust, more optimal gameplay, gameplay algorithm using elements such as reinforcement learning. Uh, hopefully we thought it would be interesting to make a multiplayer version of Tetris that has multiple EWAS playing against each other on the same board. And also we'd like to make a more true to life board that has either a vertical or slanted board so that we can utilize that aspect of gravity and, you know, simulate actual gameplay with increasing gravity, perhaps. Uh, thank you. Questions for the Tetris book? So we need to, to now uh, simulate exploding, exploding blocks, uh, yeah, some fracture mechanics or something like this, yeah? It's awesome. So what was the hardest, what was the most surprising part of that, of that whole pipeline? Like what was the part that you thought was going to work better that did, that it actually work?
super nice. Yeah, that's a, that's a so Interesting. We could speed that part up, but <laughs> but that's good. That's good. No, that's super insightful. I like that. Hi, this is Michael. And this is Nico. For our final project, we tried to get the Iwa to skip a rock. Rock skipping is a relatively simple, dynamic task that can be done by many people, even the kid in this picture. We thought it would be pretty cool to see if we could get a robot to do the same thing. The first challenge of our project was to model the dynamics of skipping. Skipping occurs when a rock collides with water and a surface force propels the rock upwards. We modeled this collision using a drag force outlined in a previous paper. This force is directly proportional to the contact area of the rock and favors a flat geometry and velocity. This is intuitive for how we understand skipping. For our simulation setup, we have the EWA arm position next to the water surface and table. Based on the dynamics, we chose a flat hockey puck shape for our rock and centered it on top of the table. Behind the scenes, we implemented a force system to apply the spatial force from the water. Here is the general flow of our system where we specify parameters, such as the known rock location, desired throw velocity, and release height. We then manipulate the arm to pick up the rock and throw it with the desired parameters. Lastly, we simulate the skipping dynamics. Our setup consists of a state machine to switch how we command the arm. For each of these states, we have a different underlying control method as shown. For the pickup state, we utilize simple kinematic planning and differential inverse kinematics to drag the rock to the edge of the table. This enables us to get an antipodal grasp on the rock as shown in the video. Once we pick up the rock, we load the rock to an ideal initial throwing position. We initially thought to try a similar approach with kinematic throwing by creating radial poses as seen in the picture but we were unable to throw the rock any faster than six meters per second. This occurred since, di since differential inverse kinematics only utilizes the very next pose, which would lead to unadvantageous joint positions. To overcome this, we switched to kinematic trajectory optimization. We knew we wanted a similar radial throwing trajectory. Specifically, we wanted the trajectory to pass through a release pose and a final pose as shown in the image. Since the release of the rock matters the most when throwing, we added orientation and velocity constraints at this point. In the image, you can see these poses as well as the yellow trajectory line created from the optimization. Here is a video of the arm throwing the rock. And here is a video of the, the rock skipping after being thrown. We ran our implementation over a desired set of throwing velocities. Throws were not perfect, the actual release velocity of the rock was much less than expected. This is likely due to the rock colliding with the gripper on an imperfect release. We just used the two finger gripper which is not necessarily optimal for skipping a rock. However, we still did get the rock to skip and saw that higher velocities led to more skips. We can also see the contact force decreases with each impact. After many long days, we actually did get it to skip. However, we ran into a lot of problems along the way. We saw from our results earlier that rock velocities below 10 meters per second would not skip. Uh, but we kept running into problems where the rock would fly out of the, of the gripper at desired velocities over 25 meters per second. We tried a few things to prevent this, but none of them helped. We tried different grasps, increasing grip force, decreasing the simulation DT, and even increasing friction. Still, none of this helped. and we saw the rock slip out as shown. Outside of problems with the gripper, we had some problems planning. Originally, we hoped to test how release height may affect skipping. The dynamics would tell us that a lower release height is best because this leads to a flatter velocity, but our trajectory optimizer had a hard time solving for various release heights. These are, these are the, this is the guys that we're asking on Piazza constantly, like, how do I remove every possible limit from the EWA you know, model, right? <laughs> so, I don't want force limits, I don't want acceleration limits, I don't want torque limits. What, so what was your biggest uh, surprise in the end? Yeah.
That's robotics. Yeah. Say, say, say. Why does it look like children from around you know each other? I think Ewa is not meant for, uh, for throwing at high speeds, but awesome. Design choices for dual arm robotic manipulator control. I'm Alex and I'm working with Marcel and Idan. So why dual arm robots? You have access to a whole bunch of more diverse tasks that require cooperation between both arms, as well as increased throughput. The challenge is um, you have more complexity, having twice as many degrees of freedom, plus you have to plan around the other arm. So there are three possible approaches to tackling this problem. One is you have two independent controllers, one for each arm, two independent controllers with a communication channel between the two arms, and a single unified controller. So here's a demo of two independent controllers. Both controllers don't have a any um, notion of what the other arm is doing. They're working completely independently and asynchronously. So one arm picks up objects from one side of the bin, and the other picks up objects in the other side of the bin and places them into the target bin. So here is a more detailed diagram of how we did this. We, we geofence the robots. So uh, the robot on the left picks up an uh, object from the bottom half of the bin, goes to clearance frame one, and then from clearance frame one, follows a fixed path to the drop-off location. Now the robot on the right uh, picks up objects from the top and follows a fixed path, uh, goes to clearance frame two, and then follows a fixed path down to the drop-off location. Um, the advantages of this method is that it's very simple uh, to implement and it works completely asynchronously so you don't have to wait for the other robot. But the disadvantages are that you have to manually define uh, a fixed path for each, um, each new scenario. As well as the path is not ideal because you have to move out of the way to make the clearance requirements to not uh, hit the other robot. And one failure modality is that there's a grasp boundary where no uh, robot can get Two, because the grippers have some finite width, um, making it so that some objects may not be grasped if they're right on the grasp boundary. The next approach, we kept the controllers separate from each other, but they did a communication channel between them. To study this approach, we took the task of passing an object from one robotic task to another without putting it on the ground. The communication channel carry relatively simple information. After the first arm, grasp the object and carry it to the location, send a message to the other arm that it's ready and its location. The other arm grasps the object and then send a message that the first arm should release it. The main technical challenge here is finding a good grasping pose in the air. Unlike the algorithm that was taught in the class, here the point cloud includes both the object and the gripper, and we needed to separate them before coming up with a good antipodal grasp proposal. Overall, this approach allows us to have simple controllers, but that still have some cooperation between them. On the other hand, it's good only when the chance of collision is low and is not suitable for every task. The previous methods could all solve a limited number of tasks and were not generalizable. Next, we'll tackle this problem by designing a single controller and proposing a new algorithm for path planning, optimization for both arms at the same time. In this case, the benchmark consists in picking and placing multiple objects from one bin to the other. This task becomes hard because the trajectories between both arms are constantly crossing each other. In the video, you can see we successfully achieved this task, but let's look at how we solved it. The first idea was to design a state machine that forces synchronization on both arms, meaning that each arm will have to wait for the other to finish its subtask before starting the next sequence. The second idea consisted in designing two collision-free paths from one bin to the other. We propose a novel algorithm that consists in recursively finding two frames, one for each arm, so that they are not colliding, as we can see in the visualization. The main advantage of using a single controller is that now we can achieve any feasible task, and it is space efficient. However, there are some disadvantages too. The controller becomes harder to design, the optimization becomes harder too, and synchronous movements might slower down the time to success. Nevertheless, we have to say that this method is still not perfect, and we find two main issues. First is that we only constrain the end effector position to not collide, so we can still have collisions on the rest of the arm. 
Second, the arm gets sometimes tangled with itself due to the differential IK solver. The solution for both of these problems would be to add constraints and optimize in joint space instead of end effector space. Our algorithm could perfectly incorporate this improvement and we leave it as future work. To conclude, in our project, we presented three different design choices of controllers of dual arm robots. Independent controllers are simpler to program, they can work asynchronously, but are space and time inefficient. Adding a communication channel allows us to have more collaboration between the arms and solve more tasks, but, it, but the number, number of tasks is still limited. Finally, with a single controller, we should be able to solve any task, but the optimization problem becomes harder due to the curse of dimensionality. Thank you for listening. Okay, so what surprised you? Yeah. Um, like in a lot of even really simple cases, just tangles with itself. So maybe this gives like a certain response very quickly that maybe it's safe to work. Did you use uh, the diff IK or did you use the pseudo inverse Jacobian? Okay, yeah, yeah. No, good. Okay. Any other questions? I do think dual arm planning is still hard. People, most, if you see a dual arm demo in the world, there's typically some hacks that make it work. It's, it's still hard to solve the real problem. Motion, you know, collision-free motion planning. All right. Hi, I'm Chrissy, and alongside me is Hanshi and Arif. And today, we're gonna discuss our project, which is a physics-based throwing using inverse dynamics control. So the motivation for our work stems from the fact that throwing objects is a very important skill for robots, as it is a prerequisite for many more complex and dynamic robotic manipulation tasks. Throwing can increase the efficiency of manipulation as well as expand the robot's workspace. So our goal is to construct a method for robots to successfully throw objects between one another. This problem involves solving the problems of perception, grasping, trajectory planning, inverse kinematics, as well as inverse dynamics control. And here's an example of our system and work. So first, <clears throat> the robots select the grass, execute the grass, and then it proceeds to plan a trajectory to execute the throw. As you can see, this is the trajectory that they're following that it has planned in real time. <clears throat> and then this throw is executed. And this time it was, it was successful. And then this process keeps repeating itself over and over again. As you can see, it is not always successful, but we'll go in more into detail later why. So first, let's talk about the system design. At a high level, there is a task planner or a state machine. And in this, it's broken up into like different states. The first state is perception and grasp selection, where it determines grass, executes those grass, and then it plans a throwing trajectory. These trajectories are then fed into an inv inverse kinematic solver to convert 3D poses into joint angles, in which the joint angles are then fed into an inverse dynamics controller to achieve precise trajectory control. So first off, starting with the perception and grasp planning, point clouds are sampled from cameras and then combined and downsampled. From this downsampled combined point cloud, normals are obtained and oriented towards the camera. With this, grass can be accurately or grass can be selected and scored, and then the best quality grasp is then taken as the final grass pose position for the robot to uh, execute towards. Yeah, for trajectory planning, the complete throwing trajectory consists of three parts. The rotation part, the linear movement part, and the second throwing part. And the robot arm will rotate to the orientation direction first, and then they will linearly move to the starting position of the throwing trajectory. And then we will generate the last segment of the throwing trajectory using our self-designed circular throwing trajectory method. And for the project problem analysis, like since our robots are throwing the wrong objects in the 3D world, but we can reduce this throwing behavior into a 2D dimensional problems. As you can see in the right figure, when the robot is heading towards the target point, we can set the throwing trajectory into the direction of the target point. 
And for the chapter planning, we use the minimize energy consumption chapter three, which is a circular arc chapter three design idea. Consider the left picture, since we know the starting position of the throwing trajectory, and the core of our solution is not to find the throwing position and the velocity directly. In, instead, we focus on the radius of the arc and the length angle, and the right side is the cost function and the related constraints. To achieve our precise control, we use the inverse times controller, because throwing involves large accelerations and velocities, and also the robot needs to achieve a certain velocity to achieve a good throw. So naive controllers that are not aware of velocities and feed forward accelerations can lag behind. These controllers are differential inverse kinematics and position controllers. So we need to incorporate velocity and acceleration, which, which motivates us to use the inverse times control because we can use the known dynamics of the system. We use inverse kinematics to generate joint angles in joint space from trajectories in 3D. And then we use shape preserving interpolation between these to generate a continuous trajectory. Then we can differentiate the trajectory to generate velocities and accelerations to feed into the inverse dynamics controller. One metric we can use to evaluate our controller is trajectory tracking performance. We use this because this is closely related to the throwing performance. On the left, we plot the tra tracking error over time, and we can see that the tracking error is highest near 21 seconds, which is when the throwing happens. We also plot the desired accelerations, which are commanded to the inverse dynamics controller over time on the right, and we see that high <laughs> Did you see the same sliding effect that the uh, the rock skippers uh, saw? Did you do you think that the um, when you were getting to high velocities? Yeah. And another thing is like the it's very important for the children to do test in detail. If they cannot test in detail, then it will automatically have two different things on the screen. Makes sense. Very nice. I feel like I, I need to find a high lie end effector for everybody or so or uh, or get some demos of an allegro hand throwing or something like that. Yeah. You guys, did you guys look at the collision geometry? I guess maybe for the rock skipping and, and even the original, th uh, the first video drawing was. I think on the collision jam, I'm pretty sure that the model that everybody would have found is the one that has multiple collision points. I think when, when David took the class, I might have given out a collision model that had only one contact point per finger, and I had some regret about that, but I fixed it for this year. <laughs> so so I, think, I think you guys must have had a few contact points, but maybe that uh, could have been better. So you guys need, yeah, lots of friction and force. Hi, everyone. My name is McCoy Becker. I'll be Hello, we are Kami Rowe and Michael, and today we will be presenting our robotic manipulation final project, the teleoperation of the Allegro hand via kinematic hand synergies in Drake. The motivation of our study came from the learning dexterity project conducted by OpenAI. They use reinforcement learning to learn how to rewrite the cube using the dexterous shadow robot hand. However, we were curious if the problem could be simplified. 
Specifically, we hypothesized that knowledge of human hand motor control could lead to easier learning of dexterous manipulation via behavior cloning. But before we could test this hypothesis, we needed to develop a teleoperation system that can be used to study human hand manipulation. This ultimately became the goal of our project. Specifically, this goal was broken into three sub-goals. The first sub-goal was to teleoperate the Allegro hand in a simulated environment. The second sub-goal comes from the idea that while the hand has many degrees of freedom, humans rarely control each joint individually. Rather, they control many of the joints simultaneously in a coordinated fashion. This idea is known as a synergy. In fact, reducing the control degree of freedom can greatly simplify the control input required required to learn a manipulation task. Thus, our second goal was to teleoperate the Allegro hand using known kinematic hand synergies. And with those first two sub-goals, our third sub-goal was to grasp various objects using teleoperation of the hand with and without synergistic control. This work is important to the design of prosthetics, robotic rehabilitation devices, and dexterous manipulation. The environment we are controlling contains the Allegro hand, the Iwa arm, and various objects. Our system was designed such that the Allegro hand and Iwa were controlled based on separate pipelines. Starting from the hand, first the hand video was captured with a single, uncalibrated RGB camera. Using MediaPipe Hands, a software that can track hand kinematics, we obtained joint positions of the operator's hand. This is passed into the de desired states of the Iwa. Then we pass those states in the inverse dynamics controller to output torque for each of the controllable joints of the hand. Once this is passed into the plant, the simulator shows the Allegro hand moving like this. On the Iwa side, we came up with a set of poses that we wanted its end effector to follow. Using inverse kinematics, we find the joint positions of the arm. The same workflow as the hand is repeated to obtain the simulation of the arm's motion. With our teleoperation pipeline, we were able to accurately track the positions of our hand joints and command the Allegro hand to follow our motions, composing itself into a peace sign, a fist, or other desired configurations. We controlled the system in real time, but our controller occasionally overshot its intended target before stabilizing. Each digit can be commanded individually, and inputs from the pinky are ignored because the Allegro hand only has four fingers. We were also able to control the position and orientation of the hand by using sliders to command the EWA positions using an inverse kinematic solver, which we used during our grasping tests. Here we show that we were able to successfully implement teleoperation using kinematic hand synergies. We see the human teleoperating the hand to make a peace sign. However, in the case where there is one synergy, all the joints are moving in a coupled manner simultaneously. As we increase the number of synergies in the controller, we see that the Allegro hand begins to look more like the peace sign that the human hand is prescribing. That is because, as we add synergies, we are effectively adding more individual control degrees of freedom. Through teleoperation, we are able to maintain a firm grip on a cube resting in the palm of the Allegro hand. However, without accurate force feedback from the simulation, we often relied on exaggerated movements to achieve our desired grip, fully forming a fist instead of a gentle grip on the cube, for example. Unfortunately, when we attempted to grasp objects placed on a table, we had serious difficulties forming a stable grip, and often inadvertently applied very large forces to our test objects when trying to grab them. This would cause the simulation to become unstable, sometimes to the point of crashing the system. We showed our implementation of teleoperating a multi-finger robotic hand in Drake. We used human demonstration captured by an RGB camera. We used synergies to simplify the degrees of freedom to control the robotic hand. Although some aspects of our implementation were unsuccessful, we think that this project paves a promising way forward to understand robotic control for dexterous manipulation. We want to improve our contact simulation to achieve stable graphs, and ultimately, we want to apply this work to conduct behavior cloning of manipulation tasks based on human demonstration. I watched most of these this morning, you know, the, 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 but uh, I, what was the thing when the Allegro went unstable and the simulation shot off, something flew into the real image. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> like what? <laughs> There was like some, it looked like someone threw a t-shirt through the camera or something. Yeah.
So what do you think would be the, the thing that would give you more, you, you said, it sounded like you suggested feedback, force feedback would be necessary. Do you think you could do less? Do you think you could just yeah, VR or? Some of the desired feedback tools that we had before, I think if you're on the office, it's a service. Uh, but we think that for like random like demands that we really need them, to maybe make an investment in those, because we can't really expect changes like that. Ah, all right. Do you think the, um, Shadow hand would be better? The, the, the more dexterous hand? All right. Future work. Oh, good. Burns. What about the tracking software you used to run? And also, what if Alex was doing some stuff for him? This tracking software was called Mediapart. The output was putting in two port pairs, the port was being in the wrong one. You burned it up like the coordinates? Yeah, and then uh, we were able to use some tracking to push that over. And you guys have a haptic glove to play with later, yeah? Yeah, so we have a haptic glove, but that one is only on the other one to the right side. All right. <laughs> Systems problems. Okay, is um, Nikita here? Oh, yeah, okay, good. Hi, everyone. My name is Nikita, and in this talk, I would like to introduce my work on space, bricklayering robotic system. The problem is the following. Given a floor plan that is specified as a set of dash lines, the system should be able to construct the building of certain height by layering bricks on top of each other according to the floor plan. They might be single or multiple robotic arms working together, and the number of bricks can be as high as hundreds. After parsing the floor plan and constructing poses for each brick, the first step is computing trajectories under a set of constraints that will guarantee gentle placement of the bricks, collision avoidance, and also avoidance uh, of high velocities and unrealistic accelerations in the robot joints. As the first attempt, I tried using global kinematic trajectory optimization on joint positions to optimize end-to-end -end trajectories from the source to the destination with a large set of constraints shown below. Unfortunately, the resulting optimization problem turned out being very complex, and it was not able to cover most of the bricks. Then I decided to simplify the optimization problem by decoupling trajectory construction from solving inverse kinematics. I also split end-to-end -end trajectories into three regions, each with different constraints. For example, the grip and the move return regions have relaxed constraints on the grip uh, rotation, while the approach region strictly constrains both the poses and velocities to allow gentle placement of the bricks. The most challenging part here is planning the move return trajectory, as this, should, like, this part of trajectory should avoid collisions with the previously built walls and the robot itself. For this project, I simplified the problem by, const by constraining the move return zone to be always higher than the destination, uh, the height of the destination brick. And I'm also using simple tra tangential trajectories in order to bypass the robot body. The constructed trajectories here are expressed in the grip poses and they don't correspond to actual joint positions. So the next step is to solve inverse kinematics to define actual trajectories for the robot. The problem is formulated as joint centering optimization with a set of constraints based on the part of the trajectory from the previous slide. The algorithm for solving inverse kinematics for all bricks is shown on the left. In short, we construct several possible collision-free trajectories for each brick and interpolate them. Then we try to solve constraint inverse kinematics for each po po point of the trajectory. And if there is a trajectory for which inverse kinematic is solvable for every point, commit it. If there are multiple such trajectories, commit the shortest. This slide shows visualization of the coverage made with point clouds. Green clouds correspond to the reachable bricks, red to unreachable. The whole trajectory planning and inverse kinematic optimization can be solved offline, and the output can easily, uh, can, can easily be uh, the metrics, such as the number, cover, the number of covered bricks, and also the number of uncovered clusters, and so on. These metrics can be used to build higher level optimizations on top of it, for example, to search for the best position of, uh, of the robot or multiple robots that result in the best coverage. And in this work, I tried this. So, uh, in general, there might be many, many possible, different possible approaches to optimize coverage, with multiple robots, and in this work, I tried a simple greedy search. So the idea is to that was going to happen, but I, I I was prepared to show like a couple of these last little bit by optimization. However, the placement of the bricks is highly constrained, and uh, here uh, here uh, the, the manipulator always puts bricks. Uh. So here the second robot starts working. They work at the same time. So this comes with better coverage, but it.
You said global trajectory optimization at the beginning. What did you mean by global trajectory optimization? Or I mean, so we link the bridge, and then there is a spark, and you need to link the bridge to another point by passing like walls and the rope itself. And then I'm just trying to construct this, this trajectory from like from. So like end to end, in, yeah. it's in time. You're, you're doing the whole thing, like maybe the multimodal or something like that. Exactly, yeah. But it's with, still with the, the SNOP or whatever. It's still like the local method. Uh, the, the optimization is local and subject to local minima. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because there. Because of the kinematic, because of the optimi optimizer being too weak, or because the kinematics are too limited. I think it's because the optimizer starts to overuse it sometimes. Yeah. Because there's too many constraints and the error errors are just too complicated. Nice. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. I know I didn't get the full slides, but I was very impressed by the the number of things you got in there. Okay. Herson. Yeah. Yeah. The peg and hole problem is a classic problem in robotics where an object is inserted into a hole that fits the object tightly. For this project, I chose to work on a variation of the problem with a square peg and a square hole. The goal was to first be able to perform the task knowing the precise locations of the block and the hole, and then find out how much harder the problem becomes when some inaccuracy is introduced. Here we have the setup used for the project with the Iwa arm, the gripper, a red block that will be our peg, and a hole formed from blue blocks that are welded in place. Also, there's a camera floating high above the block that we can use for determining the x and y coordinates of the block. Here, a pseudo-inverse controller is used to control the spatial orientation of the gripper. The exact positions of the block and hole are known, so a valid trajectory can be commanded to the robot to put the block in the hole. The gripper rotates to avoid hitting the hole, grips the block above its center of mass, avoids obstacles, lowers the block into the hole, and lets go. Now we introduce vision to the problem. These are the points seen from the camera that passed through an RGB filter, and they represent the top of the block pretty well. However, notice a row of points to the left hanging off of the block. Due to that rebellious row, the average of the points will not be the exact center of the block. The insertion fails, but two corners of the block go in, showing that at least the y-coordinate of the block was correct. To solve this predicament, I devised a spiral search method. If an upper bound for the error in the position of the block can be determined, that gives a square area spanning out from the attempted insertion point where the hole must be located. So the idea is to move to one of the corners of this square area and then move along a square spiral trajectory, spiraling to the center of the area. All the while, the block is being pressed down into the surface of the hole. The termination condition would be when there's a drop in normal force on the arm. Unfortunately, since not all rotations of the block are constrained when the block is held by the gripper, the block rotates when pressed down into the hole, and since it is partially inserted, the gripper cannot move to perform the spiral search. Also, the block has rotated away from the correct orientation, so all hope is lost. For future work, I would love to try this with gripper arms that have a stronger grip or have a higher friction coefficient. If that doesn't work, I would like to try it with a gripper with four arms. I have faith that this can be made to work. Awesome. You just need to squeeze the heck out of it. That's what we learned from the other. Uh, <laughs> why is it sinking in so much? Is that the collision geometry being recessed? Or? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. But, but like, uh, that's uh, not something I investigated because it's not really like relevant to the goal. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. Yeah, so, why, why? Yeah. <laughs> so what surprised you the most in that? That's fair. How difficult everything is was the answer. Yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. So I think, uh, is Radhika here? All right. Nice. Yes. I can't see that far. Hi. My name is Radhika Ghoshal, and today I will talk about my project on RIT planning for push manipulation.
This project focuses on generating trajectories to push a box from a start configuration to a goal using sampling-based planning. We re-implemented prior work by Zito et al. titled Two-Level RT Planning for Robotics Push Manipulation and learned a lot along the way. Here's a quick summary of the two-level planner. The outer loop of the two-level planner samples box configurations in its C space to get series of configurations like this. The start config is marked in red and the goal is marked in green. And the inner local push planner operates in the C space of the robot to find feasible push sequences between the sampled box configurations. The local planner checks for feasibility by running forward simulations inside it. Note that the original paper uses purely kinematic methods to generate these push sequences, and the quality of pushes here isn't that great. Let me show a few more. For the implementation, the EWA push planner outputs a trajectory of desired end effector poses, which is then fed to the differential inverse kinematics controller to convert to joint position commands. Turns out, the purely kinematic local push planner doesn't work well for us. Due to its poor quality pushes, RIT ends up requiring a large number of samples to find push, push sequences to the goal. This path usually ends up being circuitous and unusable. In the RIT plot above, it wasn't possible to find a path with even a large number of samples. So we decided to use a Cartesian force controller. This consistently produces high quality pushes against the box during testing, but we didn't have time to integrate it into the full RIT loop. For future work, we'd like to complete the integration of the force control model into the full RIT loop. Finally, I realized that force control is awesome and often makes things easier than position slash velocity control. Thanks for watching. Here, here, force control. So how are you gonna put the force controller into the, is this gonna be an RRT extend is gonna be using the controller? Yeah, so like you're running the forward simulation inside your RRT yeah. extend operation. So like I would need to pull in Force controller inside that model. Yeah, yeah. I, I have a, I and have a yeah, nice. I, get I think that would, that, would, that would make it work. But I have no idea how the original paper ever managed to get this working. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't it happens. Okay. Yes? Uh, what kind of push sheet method should we use for finding an error point in the graph? Right. So um, for the push sheet method, we, we know, we know the dips between the X and the Y position, but for the dips in orientation, So it's just the differences in the pose of the brick. Yes. yes. Cool. Okay, I think Jared said he was going to come later. I'm trying to. Yeah, sure. Later. Yeah. Okay. I'll I'll come back to anybody who shows up later. Um, I think Annie Rood and Ken's here. Kenneth, yeah, there you go. Good. All right. Our project is Automated Robust Stacking of Prisms, also known as PrismBot. I'm Ethan. I'm Kenneth. I'm Annie. We care about stacking because stacking is a cognitively challenging task. There's applications of stacking in construction and fabrication. We focus our problem on stacking prisms. Prisms are easier to grasp and stack compared to arbitrary objects due to their simple geometry and flat surfaces. All right, so our initial method was mostly adapted from the bin picking notebook, but as you can see, it was not very robust. It could not robust, robustly grasp objects or even place them down precisely enough to build a tall stack. Um, so in order to mitigate this, we use a state machine. The state machine robustly clears the space where the stack is going to be built by detecting when the stack falls over so that we don't end up stacking over fallen debris, which would render an unstable stack. Um, we also use self-correction when motion tracking errors detected so that the, the trajectories that we execute are the trajectories that we expect. 
We also do center of mass calculations so that we can precisely place the blocks such that their center of masses line up vertically. Recall from class that we can estimate center of mass by lump parameter estimation. If the object is held still, in fact, it's possible to calculate the term separately and separately calculate the mass and the center of mass of a held object just by looking at the external torques of the EWA. The only problem is, is that the only the X and Y coordinates of the center of mass of the object are identifiable in the world frame, since the Z coordinate is in the direction of gravity. The solution is to just measure from two poses and use a mathematical program to find the optimal center of mass that matches up with the measured external torques. So another problem we ran into in our initial methods was problems related to grasping. Our main problem was that we would often try to grasp points that were near edges. So our grasps would either fail, or if they succeeded, they would often be wobbly and would result in poor placing. So the way we fix this is to develop an edge heuristic so we can avoid um, grasping your edges. So the way it worked is that after we picked a, a target grasp point, we would sample the 25 closest points spatially from our point cloud and collect their normals. Um, and then across these 25 normals, we would find the minimum dot product between any pair and we would have a cutoff because um, for a face, this heuristic would give us a large value since all the normals would point in the same direction. And we would get a lower value near edges um, because we'd have normals from two different faces, um, which would result in a lower dot product. We also uh, improved our perception by adding segmentation. Um, we use the DB scan algorithm to segment objects spatially. And we also segmented them via hue in, to account for the case where two objects were touching each other. Um, and this let us detect which objects were in the stacking zone and move them away. And it also helped us um, pick the order of blocks to stack. For our final results, we evaluated our system by testing it on 10 trials with varying number of objects and object type. So you can see here that we tested two, three, four, and five rectangular prisms, and the same for pentagonal prisms. We have a high success rate for less than or equal to three objects, um, which is a greater than 90% success rate. However, as we increase the number of objects, we can see that the success rate drops. And for pentagonal prisms, the success rate also drops. One common error that we saw, especially for a large number of objects, was a similar to crashing due to the high number of collisions that are involved when the stack gets taller. Here, you can see our system working in full. First, our robot clears the object from the stacking cylinder so that it can replace it with more precision. Now you can see for each object, our robot rotates the object a bit in order to do the center of mass calculation to again place it precisely on top of the preceding one. In this simulation, our, our, our robot is able to successfully stack seven objects on top of each other. And we think that this is actually the maximum that is possible for our current simulation. As for the sixth block, it is currently not visible to the top. The top of the block is not visible to the cameras. Thanks for listening. Our code is publicly available on GitHub for others to build on top of. So did you did you hide the center of mass in random places inside the block? Is that what you did? So what was the variability that gave you uh, different? I mean, was it only the bricks, uh, same initial conditions, or where did you? Yeah. Very nice. I'm glad you got the center mass estimation working. That's perfect. Yeah. Any other questions? All right. Jared, I knew you were coming at 3:30s. We just passed you, but I'm going back. All right. <laughs> we're talking to you about my final project, which is called Greenbot. It's a manipulation system capable of identifying, picking, and placing recyclable waste. So, how exactly does it work? It uses a custom trained mask RCNN model for object segmentation. Um, given a labeled and segmented point cloud, it can find a near optimal antipodal grasp for this object. It uses a slightly modified version of a pseudo inverse controller to move around. And of course, it uses some fun 3D models that I found on the internet. In terms of the mask RCNN model, it's trained the same way that we approached it in class, which is that we start from a pre-trained model using the COCO data set, and then we strip the last layer of nodes and retrain it such that the output is the labeled and masked images corresponding to the set of objects that I'd given the simulation. 
From here, uh, anytime the robot actually wants to pick something up and make a decision, it can query two different uh, RGB images from cameras on either side of the picnic table. And then it can pass off these RGB images to mask RCNN. And from here, what it gets is labeled and segmented depth images from mask RCNN, which you can project to XYZ space and get a comprehensive point cloud for a given object. Once it has this point cloud, uh, we generate around 25 GRASP candidates. Uh, these candidates are found by choosing a random point on the point cloud, calculating its normal, projecting this normal such that it's planar with the XY plane, and then aligning the gripper X axis with this, with this projected normal. From here, it wants to select the most antipodal grasp, which is it tries to maximize the alignment with the normals of the point cloud with the gripper X axis. From here, the trajectory planning is a pretty simple scheme. Uh, we just simply interpolate between a few different key poses, such that we have you know, a, a home pose for the EWA. We have a pre-pick pose, which is just slightly above the object of interest. We have a grasp pose, which is generated from the grasping scheme, and we have a pose just above the desired drop-off fit. From here, we can differentiate this linearly interpolated trajectory and use a pseudo-inverse controller to move around. In order to actually test GreenBot, we asked how many objects can GreenBot sort in 60 seconds? That is, we gave GreenBot four potential objects on the picnic table and gave it 60 seconds to sort as many as possible. Of the 56 valid tests that we ran, 67% of them performed perfectly, uh, sorting all four objects in the allotted time, and around 88% of them performed near perfectly, sorting at least three of the four objects correctly. In terms of future work, I think mobile manipulators are really cool. So one potential application of this is instead of using a stationary EWA arm, use some sort of cheap mobile manipulator in simulation and try to get it to actually move around the environment, traverse, pick up items, and navigate over to the waste bin to drop it off. Thanks so much for listening to my presentation and I'm happy to answer some questions. I have a totally nerdy question. How did, what was the OBJ file that made the transparent bottle work in the RGBD renderer? I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> I see it shows that. Yeah. So the RGB just sees the blue bottle. That's right. That's what I, okay. That's con My world is consistent at least. Yeah. Nice. I mean, I would love for it to render in transparent objects, but all right. Questions? What was the hardest part of that whole pipeline? Mass Garcia is crazy. <laughs> nice. Okay. Thank you. I think Jim's next. Speed cubing. Uh, <laughs> Speed cubing is the task of solving a Rubik's cube as fast as possible. Cubing is of great interest to robotics, as it requires precise manipulation. For example, if the face is not properly aligned after a turn, it can prevent the next face turn. Making turns on the Rubik's Cube quickly is an even greater challenge. Currently, there are two notable cube solving robots. The first robot was made here at MIT. Wow, that's really fast. But isn't that kind of unfair to humans? We don't have six hands, let alone six limbs. And our wrists can't rotate like motors. The second is OpenAI's robot hand. Its hardware is more fair to humans, but it is really slow. Introducing Speedcuber Bot, it aims to be a balance between the two robots. With only an arm and a gripper, it has a hardware limitation like the OpenAI robot, but it aims to make fast turns like the MIT robot. Before we get started, we need to understand move notation. U means to turn the upper face 90 degrees clockwise, U prime means to turn the upper face 90 degrees counterclockwise, and U2 means to turn the upper face 180 degrees. Before we can make a turn, we need to constrain the layers that will not turn. Initially, I was planning to have a second EO arm hold the cube in place. However, after receiving the model of the Rubik's Cube and finding out the grippers cannot really grip onto the cube, I decided to make and use a box that held the bottom layer in place. 
Because of this, Speedcuber Bot will only be able to turn the top face. To make a U move, we move the gripper to the grasp position for a U move, grasp the cube, make a clockwise turn, and ungrasp the cube. To make a U prime move, it is the same except we move the gripper to the grasp position for a U prime move and make a counterclockwise turn. To make a U2 move, we can do two U moves or two U prime moves. Our goal is to make turns quickly, so we should turn in the opposite direction of the previous move. This is because after completing a turn for a U move, the grasp position for the U prime move is closer than the grasp position for the U move and vice versa. With this plan, we can model the motion of Speedcuber Bot as a state machine. Additionally, to actually get the gripper to those positions, we solve inverse kinematics as an optimization problem to get the joint position for the desired pose. Putting it all together, we can give Speedcuber Bot a sequence of up face moves and it will execute them. The worst case turn time is 0.9 seconds, but thanks to the optimizations we made for U2 moves and the fact that going from U to U prime and vice versa is faster, the average turn time is 0.77 seconds. While a 0.13 second time save on each turn seems very little, it adds up when doing a sequence of turns, and speed keepers are looking to save every little second. We actually heard a story just the other day, Saba who just left was telling us that the Ben Katz robot, which is awesome, apparently it could go so fast that the Rubik's Cubes would explode. Do you, do you know that? Okay. <laughs> that cheap, cheap Rubik's Cubes would just go explode. All right. That was an awesome video. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, he's got a question. Oh yeah, another question. I also saw you when you were programming it in the in, in office hours one time or something. It looked like you had made a cool teleop, like some way to transition between teleop. You like you'd teleop for a minute and then you would you would turn on the autonomy for a minute and then you'd switch back to teleop. How'd you do that? Did I did I see that right? Uh, I, I, I can't do teleop. It was all teleop. Yeah. I, you I, fooled me. Yeah, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't have any. Uh, I didn't have this. Okay, nice, okay. Um, I think Jenny, you guys are next, Jenny and Danny. Ping pong is a fast paced sport that requires fast processing and precise paddle control. In this project, we created Ping Pong Bot, a pair of Kuka Iwa arms that can perform a controlled rally for multiple hits. This project is an iteration upon a previous project by D Dylan Zhao and Chaitanya Ravuri for robotic manipulation in 2021. We used their framework and simulation as a starting point, but chose to re-implement the control logic state machine and adjusted several simulation parameters to improve performance and simulation realism. As you can see, in the previous iteration of this project, the simulated ball is not nearly as bouncy as a real-life ping pong ball. To fix this, Professor Tedrick helped us learn to use some of the Drake-specific contact parameters in our SDF to control the bounciness and make it look a lot more realistic. Here, we have a simple diagram showing the high-level state machine flow. Each Iwa arm is running a separate instance of this controller, and both begin in the away state. Using the velocity vector of the ball, we know if it's traveling toward or away from a particular side of the table, and set the away or toward state as appropriate. After the ball bounces on the same side of the table as the arm, we transition to the prep state. And finally, when the ball is close to the projected contact position, we go to the hit state. If at any point, the ball velocity is pointing away from the paddle, the system resets to the away state. In the away state, the desired linear and angular velocity of the end effector is calculated by targeting the home pose of the paddle, centered and slightly behind the edge of the table, 
with the paddle tilted up. To check whether the ball is actually traveling toward the arm, then trigger a state transition to the toward state, it calculates the dot product of the velocity vector of the ball and the vector from the end effector to the ball position. If the dot product is negative, the ball is traveling towards the paddle, and the controller will transition to the toward state. When the controller transitions to the toward state, it uses the x and y velocity components of the ball and projects the y coordinate of when it reaches a specific x value in the world frame. This calculation is only performed once, and the target pose is set to the same as the home pose, except with the updated y coordinate for the projection. Using the time before the ball bounces to move to this intermediate pose is essential for getting the robot roughly close enough to the actual pose needed to hit the ball correctly. Without this step, there's generally not enough time after the bounce for the arm to move to the prep pose before the ball has already reached the contact point. When the ball has a positive z component velocity and is slightly above the height of the table, we know that the ball has just bounced. After the ball bounces on the table, the arm enters the prep state. In the prep state, our controller uses the ball's current position and velocity to predict the ball's trajectory. It then chooses a contact point along the ball's trajectory where the paddle will hit the ball. It chooses a contact point a little past the edge of the table to minimize the chances that the paddle hits the table, which we found causes the arm to start flailing wildly. The controller then attempts to find a paddle pose that will hit the ball at a target point on the other side of the table. We use the equations of projectile motion to calculate the ideal velocity of the ball after the collision so that it lands on the target point. We use the mirror law along with the incoming and outgoing ball velocities at the contact point to calculate a paddle pose that will correctly reflect the ball towards the opponent. Finally, the paddle uses this calculated pose to move to a pre-hit pose slightly behind the contact point, giving it space to accelerate before the hit. When the ball is close enough to the contact point, we transition to the hit state to start accelerating the paddle towards the ball. Intuitively, the faster the ball is traveling, the slower we want the paddle to move, otherwise we're adding too much energy to the system. If the ball is bouncing too low, we also want to tilt the paddle upwards to add more vertical impulse. After successfully hitting the ball, the velocity vector should now be pointing away from the paddle. But I, I just, I thought that was really good. Uh, yeah, that's good. Questions for these guys? I wondered about the parameters. Yeah, I wondered about the parameters that you showed. That you said it just helps you with make it more elastic to the make it bounce easier. Oh, sorry. The parameters you have to change to make the ball more elastic. Nice. Which part was the biggest surprise for you of that pipeline? Was the state machine logic like pretty good or was it? For sure. Great. Okay. Uh, Sungwan and Ming Yun, are you guys here? Yeah. All right. Most of the sport in which a player uses a set of clubs to hit the ball into the holes with as few strokes as possible. Striking a ball requires precise club control, making it even a difficult problem for human beings. In this project, we propose a framework for a robot arm to strike the ball into the holes with only one stroke. We establish our simulation environment using pipe blades with an even terrain as the golf course, including hills and flat ground. We dig a hole on the ground randomly within a 3 meters times 3 meters square. The ball is initially placed still on the tee in front of the robot player. The robot player is a handless crota evil arm with a fixed golf club as an anti-factor. 
Mokelion of Framework, the robot first switched to a preheating configuration and approached the ball slowly to put itself at the desired heating position. It calculated the desired initial velocity of the ball and then controlled the arm to heat the ball. If everything goes right, although a lot of times it doesn't, the ball will form a beautiful curve forced by the gravity and the air resistance and finally land in the hole. To make everything work, we need to plan backward carefully. First, we need to constrain the landing angle theta, because a large landing angle will make the ball bounce out of the hole. When flying in the air, the ball follows the aerodynamics, forced by gravity and the air resistance and nothing else. This makes it possible for us to do direct shooting to calculate the initial velocity of the golf ball. We aim at minimizing the flying time of the ball, subject to a set of constraints including landing constraint, landing angle constraint, and dynamics constraints. We solve the problem using Cassati solver, and the solution velocity can 100% make the ball land in the hole. After solving the initial velocity, we can calculate the desired heating configuration of the robot. We manually assign the heating point on the club and build the heating frame such that the y-axis is parallel to the ground and the z-axis aligns with the initial velocity of the ball and the contact normal. Applying a series of frame transformations, we can get the desired pose of the club. Then we do optimization to solve the desired joint angles and use kinematic trajectory optimization to control the robot to reach the desired configuration. Next step, we want to control the robot to hit the ball. Theoretically, when the contact normal is aligned with target velocity, we just need one degree of freedom to reach the target velocity. To make the system more robust, we allow two joints to be movable during the heating process. In this way, we just need a mapping from the boss target velocity back to the joint velocity. However, the heating process isn't differentiable or continuous, so it's hard to do the mapping. We propose to use data-driven methods to tackle the problem. We collect data by randomly sampling joint velocities and record the corresponding ball velocity. We observe that the data has strong linear correlation with some outliers. We apply RANSAC to filter out the outliers and try both linear regression and neural networks to feed the mapping model. Then at test time, we input the calculated ball initial velocity to get the desired joint velocity and do velocity control to hit the ball. Our framework can achieve a success rate of 19 out of 100 rollouts. The failure cases can be categorized into two sets. The strike is not successful or the landing point of the ball is not accurate enough. This inspires us with two future directions. The first is to improve our formulation for the preheating and heating process, controlling the robots in a continuous way to avoid sudden accelerations. The second is to simulate the heating process more reliably and learn. That was impressive cinematography, right? Pretty, pretty good. So, sorry, you used uh, shooting. You know, you used Cassati for shooting for the for the ball. I, tell me how those two. You said you used kinematic trajectory optimization for the arm, and then direct shooting for the ball. Is that right? How did those two go together? Perfect. But why did you need shooting for the ball? Is it because of the aerodynamics? Or you, you said there was drag. What's that? That's why it was hard. I see. I see. Okay. Very nice.
You did that yourself, you think? The, the aerodynamics, or that's just in bullet? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's the yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool, okay. Pascal and Ravi are here. Hello, we are Pascal Spino and Ravi Tejwani, and this is our final project for robot manipulation. We built a pipeline for an EWA arm to execute a trajectory over a curved surface while maintaining contact with that surface and contain, maintaining force normal to the surface. There is much prior work on robots drawing on two-dimensional surfaces, but for our project, we wanted to explore drawing on a three-dimensional curved surface. For two-dimensional surfaces, there's many simple robots that are well-suited for the task, but drawing on a three-dimensional surface requires many more degrees of freedom, for which the EWA arm is well-suited. The pipeline to our system is as follows. We take as inputs a two-dimensional trajectory plan and a three-dimensional instance of curved geometry with accurate collisions. We first estimate the point cloud corresponding to the surface of this geometry through an array of four cameras. Then we estimate normals over this point cloud. We then take our inputted trajectory and plan a three-dimensional di three trajectory over the surface while respecting the normals. And then we extract from this a series of poses, which we turn into a piecewise pose, and then pass to a differential inverse kinematics controller to execute on our EWA. Now for collision geometry, we wanted to simulate a variety of shapes, which included non-convex shapes. Um, in order to simulate these shapes in Drake, the method we chose was to perform convex decomposition, which essentially takes a non-convex shape and turns it into a series of convex shapes that approximate that surface. Here is a video of our EWAR arm executing the pipeline that we described in the earlier slides. We are taking a predefined trajectory shown in the top right of the screen and executing it over this non-convex curved geometry. As you can see, portions of this predefined motion are in contact with the surface, while portions are intentionally not in contact with the surface. In the bottom right of the screen, you can see a visualization of the trajectory that we are executing. On this slide, we show three experiments, each performing the same trajectory from the previous slide and shown on the top of this slide, but over an array of different surfaces with different curved geometry, some convex, some non-convex. As you can see in this slide, there exists a couple failure modes with our approach. These include when aspects of the EWA arm collide with the geometry, when the curvature of the geometry is too severe, or when the plan's trajectory extends beyond the bounds of the curved geometry. We envision multiple applications to this control pipeline beyond the aspects of drawing tasks. For example, window washing on curved windows, or washing curved dishes, or even applying massages to humans. Essentially, any task where you must apply force normal to a surface, and that surface is not necessarily sh uh, flat. One more thing we would like to consider in the future is the So you were gripping the chalk, yeah? Oh, so the, I see you welded it to one finger. Because I saw one point where it came open. But that was, it was welded to the finger that it moved with. Ah, you tricked me. Good. <laughs> nice.
Awesome. Any other questions for these guys? Yeah. Okay, we're actually not far off time, but public service announcement. I don't technically have the room after four. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't, oftentimes people, I couldn't, I asked for it. They said, no, it's booked, but a lot of, it's been booked all semester and like three times people have come in at 4.15. So let's see. I do have a room across the, across the hall as a, as a, so worst case, if someone comes in and looks really mad, we'll just politely go to the, the room across and keep going, yeah? Because there's a lot of good presentations coming up. The people who said they were arriving at three, uh oh, uh, the right. <laughs> oh no, that's good. That's good. That's good. Yes. Okay, quick, quick stretch session. That sounds good. Add all my deck three, three slides from my message too. I think there's a couple people that are already queued up here, but <clears throat> okay, um, I can open Slack. I think the students here are those who are not, who doesn't have the slide. I actually check the slide. Okay. I don't think they have their project in there. <coughs> okay. So we have to add them. Is Ruben here? He's peeing. He's peeing. From ancient history to modern scandals, robotic chess has captured the awe and curiosity of humanity. In order to play, all systems must understand the current piece locations generate a feasible move, and execute the move in the physical world. In addition, any simulated chess playing system must have a complete simulated environment. Chess solvers and planar pick and place machines have a variety of well-documented solutions. However, the issue of board perception remains open. Current perception methods include using top-mounted cameras, as shown left, or using custom-built chess boards, as shown right. Unfortunately, these methods are physically complex, awkward to install, and gather limited information about the game state. Ideally, a chess system would be physically simple while understanding both the integer coordinates of all pieces as well as their spatial location. We now present ChessBot. ChessBot is a deep perception and manipulation system for all your robotic chess playing needs. Using a single, side-mounted RGBD sensor, ChessBot can read the state of an arbitrary simulated chessboard, producing both exact piece locations and reconstructed point clouds of all pieces, including occluded geometry. Using this, ChessBot determines the optimal next move and executes it using its robotic arm. ChessBot is designed as a continuous loop. First, the user enters their move. Then, this move is sent to the simulator, which teleports the user's piece to the appropriate location. Then, ChessBot utilizes its deep perception system to segment and reconstruct the modified chess board. This allows ChessBot to determine what move the user made. Finally, ChessBot queries its chess solver to generate a feasible move which it promptly executes. Let's take a closer look at ChessBot's perception system. We first separate an RGBD image into a depth mask and color image. 
Using a fine-tuned mask RCNN, we segment and label the RGBD image. This allows us to create a set of partial point clouds. Next, we use the labels from mask RCNN to determine what piece type each point cloud belongs to. We use ICP to fit a reference point cloud corresponding to this type of piece to the original partial point clouds. Then, we use the point clouds for board inference and manipulation. However, no system is perfect, including ChessBot. In testing, we found two primary failure modes, kinematic failures and perception failures. On the left, we see that a kinematic failure resulted in a piece being knocked over. On the right, we see that a piece was perceived in the incorrect location. While these are annoying for gameplay, we think that more sophisticated move detection algorithms may circumvent these issues. We hope you enjoyed learning about ChessBot. Thank you for watching. That was a tour de force, very impressive. Which was the hardest part? Yeah. And why did you use WSG instead of the Panda Gripper? I have two reasons. One is that there's more example sets. Ah, uh, yeah, um, fair. Nice. I did cheat a little bit and made the point of jump quite as tall as it It's all good. Anybody else? Oh, yeah? Go ahead. Awesome. Okay, Ruben's back. Let's uh, let's do Ruben. Hi, my name is Ruben Castro, and I'm here to present my final project for robotic manipulation, which is a volleyball setting robot. Now, this is interesting because so far we've been focusing mostly on quasi-static tasks, but I suspect that as we get into more complex tool usage, we will need to be agile and more powerful. And the question to ask when it comes to this is, what happens if the pipette slips? If that's the case, in 0.1 seconds, it could fall around 5 centimeters. So if we can't re-grasp it in time, gravity is in control, and we could reach failure. Now, volleyball itself is pretty interesting because it's fast, it's forceful, and it's fun. We only have around 80 milliseconds to control the ball, and we're reaching the upper bound of our torque limits. There's three main components to this. We need to sense where the ball is coming from, we need to absorb it, and then we need to relaunch it to the desired position. My research focuses on making actuators for robotic hands, so I took the parameters from my fingers and input them as parameters for the simulation itself. There are three main Legos to our project. That's the manipulator, the robot arm, and the ball tracker. The manipulator itself consists of two fingers with two degrees of freedom each. There's a Y ship at the end for stability and centering while catching the ball and running operation space impedance control on them. This allows the ball to act as a mass spring damper system where we can dynamically change the stiffness depending on how much energy we want to input into the ball. Originally, we were hoping to just use the fingers to launch the ball. However, we quickly ran into torque limits, which means that we needed to use the arm itself to also launch the ball. The robot arm is an EO arm, which is capable of reaching a desired pose by using a Cartesian space PID controller. Now the fingers by themselves cannot input enough energy into the ball to get it to the desired height. So we have to figure out what speed we need to launch the arm at. And we can do that using the simple energy equations. From there, we simply follow a linear trajectory using constant acceleration in the desired direction of the ball until we reach the velocity launch. Now the ball tracker is pretty simple. If it's a parabolic trajectory to a few sampled points in the air, we assume perfect state estimation and we have a tolerance for around three centimeters. Now we have all the pieces together and we have a robot that can set the volleyball.
Out of 10 trials that we did with different initial parameters, we averaged around 7 sets with a high of 12 sets and a low of 2 sets. The output height was not as accurate as we were hoping it to be. We failed to reach the desired height by around 0.5 meters. In conclusion, we were able to show a robotic system that uses constraints based on real world manipulators and it's capable of playing the agile task of volleyball. Second of all, we have seen that impedance control plus compliant hardware has allowed the high level to be simpler. We are simply using a constant acceleration linear trajectory. Good. <laughs> Any questions for Ruben? The collision geometry of the end effector. Um, so I significantly simplified what we actually have. Uh, this is like Do you have it with you? Actually, yeah. <laughs> we have like 30 seconds, but if you could hold it up and show. <laughs> yeah, because I have it in my other class. I see. Nice. And do you think the impedance control was essential? You couldn't have done the same thing with position control, you think? I mean, yeah. at, sorry, at the arm. I think that if you did position control, it gets a lot more complicated, mainly because you, like, you're only conscious of the ball for a millisecond. So if you're trying to control the ball uh, throughout the whole time, you need a lot of points in between that. So to do that, I don't know, you could position control like ejection from the distance, uh, but it just compute too slow. So if you're trying to do this in real time, I think impedance control allows you to kind of do it. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. So um, I think Jacob's next. Yeah. Start. Hi, everyone. This is me and Thomason. I'm Bing Wei Yan. Today, mm -hmm. we're talking about large language models for abstract pick and place task planning in Drake. Uh, so the introduction and motivation is that abstract task planning in robotics is really hard and that humans take uh, a lot of our abstract and semantic understanding of tasks and the way we communicate tasks uh, for granted. And these are in no way obvious to the robot uh, receiving the tasks. And so the idea is to use a large language model, such as GPT-3, which is trained on vast amounts of text data that encode um, kind of human reasoning into the text data. And uh, these large language models uh, demonstrate impressive high-level abstract reasoning capability because of their training set. Uh, to act as a robot's uh, brain. Our approach is use abstract human divine task planner in Drake. We prompt the large language model with environment context and the go, and we don't do any other prompt engineering, which is kind of surprising. The large language model generates a series of pick and place actions. Note that thanks to large language models output is very is virus and is kind of neural language. So we need some functions to standardize the output and extract pick and place specific actions. So here's an example of a prompt uh, that we provide the manipulator. I think it's important to note that our Drake environment is just a modification of the chapter five uh, bin picking example. And so we just have a simple tabletop environment with our manipulator in the center and a few objects that are generated around it. So the context we provide the LLM uh, are the objects in the scene. So in this case, we have the four blocks and the four plates or disks. And then the goal that we provide to the uh, LLM is that we want to sort the blocks onto the disks. And while not explicitly stated, the idea here is that the LLM will notice the relation between the blocks and the disks and place the blocks on the, this, the corresponding collar. And now, surprisingly, they did what we guessed. They generate step-by-step -step instructions about where to put each block exactly by their color, which is great for translate into instructions. So let's look at the example of our videos. There is actually three tasks. And uh, the first task is place the blocks into a square formation. 
and see it understand the square has four corners. The second task is to sort the blocks onto the disks, and which was, which we have already illustrated before, it is sorted by color. The final stack is stack all the blocks on the red disk, which demonstrate it understand what does it mean by stack and what does it mean by the geometric re relationships. Uh, so the most important takeaways from this project are that uh, with a simple simple helper function, uh, LLMs are capable of kind of directly producing this series of pick and place locations for your planner. And so this is surprisingly without prompt engineering, so you can kind of just use a large language model out of the box for this. Um, and so you can kind of treat this as a trajectory providing black box because you can compute the trajectories on each of the uh, provided pick and place locations. And so each time your planner then completes one of those trajectories, we can then reprompt the LLM uh, for a new task. And because we're only operating with trajectories here, uh, in Drake and the rest is handled by the LLM, um, this enables more complex tasks because they're often parameterized just in the trajectory. And so what's really cool about this is this enables real time. That's, that's crazy. So I, maybe I missed the simple helper function part, but how do you how do you not have to do say can kind of things? How how did it come up with the actions you know how to take? Yeah, I think it's just because we don't need to do pick and place actions. So the object from the LLM varies, but it varies every time move object x into the location of object y, and so the small helper function is just that uh, the form that we need to ask for. So the helper function is you translating a slightly more diverse text into your pick and place for primitives. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions? <laughs> cool. All right. I'm feeling good about nobody. Shen, is there like a line of people about to come into the room? Oh, no, no, no. I was saying bye to you. Oh, yeah, yeah. You're good. You're good. Okay. I think Catherine is up. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Caribot, which is our final project in making an Iwa draw caricatures in simulation using Drake and MeshCat. So we decided to choose character drawing as our task because it presents a really interesting manipulation problem. So as you can see in this video demonstrated here, caricatures inherently have a technical and creative component in that you really want to emphasize certain features of the image or caricature you're trying to present. At the same time, you can't lose recognizability uh, without sacrificing you know, the comical nature of the caricature itself. So for our project, we really focus on the technical precision required to generate and then draw a caricature of a given input image. And so in the future, this could have use cases including facial imaging drawing, where drawing features are important, like police suspect drawings or courtroom sketches, or even drawing AI-generated faces. And the precision itself could be useful in non-facial drawings like architecture or manufacturing. Now to move on to our approach. So Caribot consists of two subsystems. So given an input image, we feed it into our image processing system, and then that generates a set of trajectory points that the manipulation system then uses to draw the actual output image. Now the first step in our image processing subsystem is to create a caricature from a given input image. And to do this, we refer to um, the Carimi paper by Gu et al. and recreated their um, machine learning model in Google Colab. Using this model, we generated caricatures of different input images. And as you can see, there's like a variety of different warping techniques that are applied um, pretty randomly to generate like a diverse set of possible caricatures. Um, here are some other results that we have. And basically our model um, or a pipeline displays five randomly generated caricatures and allows the user to select one that they want to draw, such as this one. The second step was to process the caricaturized image using the canny edge detection algorithm, which through testing we determined was the best way to pick out a set of definitive 
um, contours that our robot should draw from an image. So the steps of this algorithm, just very quickly, were first to convert a picture to grayscale, secondly, to apply Gaussian blurring to reduce noise in the image, um, third, using an intensity gradient, um, definitive like high contrast edges were identified, and then finally, um, using some kind of thresholding process, um, more edges were like more clearly defined. And basically, here are some results of the canny edge detection algorithm. As you can see, the new image has like a bunch of lines that are somewhat unnecessary to like fully recreating the image. So to deal with this, we also filtered some of these contours by arc length to remove like small ones that were not necessary and end up with a better picture of the subject. And this was the original input photo um, that we ran the algorithm on. Now, moving on to the manipulation system, we'll also add in a video of Carrybot drawing a character on the side here, since the process takes quite a bit of time. For Carrybot's manipulation system, we took Russ's drawing example, combined it with the robot painter class from a previous piece set, and changed the controller to diffIK. We welded the chalk to the robot's right finger, and when the chalk comes into contact with the chalkboard, a line is drawn following the robot's trajectory. We chose to base it off of the robot painter code since the piece set featured the EWA following given points, which encapsulates one of the main features of CarryBot. To generate the actual trajectory, we take the points from edge detection and then apply scaling, offsets, and rotations in order to translate the image into the world frame. We also had to insert additional lift points at the start and end of the line in order for the EWA to transition between distinct lines without drawing on the chalkboard. Here, we can see the output image of the EWA drawing a character of the rock. We also faced many challenges in both subsystems during the project. For the image processing subsystem, we had trouble filtering out the lines that we did not want since it varied quite a bit between images and often produced very questionable results. Then, during the manipulation, we had a lot of trouble controlling how the robot arm lifted up from the chalkboard, which caused a lot of extraneous lines. And now that CarryBot is done drawing, let's take a look at the results. Um, here we have Russ in his many, many stages, and here's the final result. In the future, there are many areas of improvement for CarryBot to work on. Here are some of them, such as noise reduction and more cartoon-like caricatures, as well as different applications for CarryBot, such as using different art utensils and doing non-facial drawing tasks. Thank you for your time. Sorry, I don't look like the rock. <laughs> uh, so how did you go from, so the edge detector gives you an image, right? So how do you get the strokes from the image? I missed that part. Um, so the edge detection algorithm actually gives you the contours. Oh, it does? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right from canning? That's, Super nice. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a few small ones. Um, I'm glad that you can have draw on a project here. Um, so can you answer the question, did you run into the issue that it would give you contours that are technically in a long singular stroke, but you have to take a substantially number of big lines? Do you end up pushing them together, or what did you do? Do you run into that issue at all? Okay, so let's keep moving, but this is, that's awesome. Thank you. My name is Lucian Corrubius.
To find when the projectile first gets near enough to the robot, I use a linear optimization where I minimize the decision variable t while constraining the projectile to stay within reach of the robot. This effectively finds the earliest time where we could possibly grab the object. By instead maximizing t with the same constraints, we can instead find the exit time of the projectile, which is the last possible moment where we could catch it. Now that we have the time of entry for the projectile, and since we know that the projectile has a constant orientation and geometry, we can calculate a comfortable pre-grasp pose for the object. A comfortable pre-grasp pose is one where the gripper is always facing away from the robot, so as to maximize range and movement capabilities while catching. The gripper trajectory module calculates a full end effector trajectory from initial pose to final grasp pose. Phase 1 is the transition from initial configuration to pre-grasp pose, which was calculated by the previous module. For the position component, I linearly as there is no obstacles to avoid. For the orientation, I used a quaternion slurp to avoid gimbal lock and find a smooth trajectory. Phase 2 is the transition from pre-grasp to grasp pose, where we must track the projectile's motion while moving closer in order to grab the object. The position component can be determined by the physics equation from the first module with an additional offset as the gripper moves closer to the projectile. The orientation at this point is constant because there is no rotation in the object. The final module is responsible for translating the end effector trajectory into an executable joint trajectory to send to the robot. The approach used in this system is to solve an inverse kinematic optimization problem, which attempts to minimize the distance between the current joint configuration and a preset nominal configuration while constraining motion to follow the end effector trajectory. When forming the bounds for this optimization, I was more lenient with the upper bound of the Z component, as projectiles normally came from above. Now we can observe the full system at work. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it interesting. Awesome. I think your beginning was the one with the chopsticks, wasn't it? I, that was hilarious. I'm sorry, it didn't go. <laughs> Any questions for this one? So you didn't deal with the, I mean, it looked like you was just barely staying in the fingers. I see. Awesome. Very nice. Okay. Let's get. No, David. Awesome. I'm sorry to keep moving, but so I don't see Tom. I, I, you, Tom, I know, but the other Tom I don't see here. And is Kaza here? Okay, I'm going to go to. Um, uh, Shruti's here, all right.
Rubik's Cube, the puzzle that has taken the world and us by storm. It requires smarts and practice, but more importantly, it requires precision in motion and complex planning to physically do. And that is why a project is a bimanual Rubik's Cube manipulator. What does that mean? Well, it means that we have put two EVAs in a simulation, like Meshcat will show, and made a Rubik's Cube flow in space to avoid dealing with the gravity. And then we've used low-level motion planning to turn places on the cube. We wanted to make a controller that could take in a list of moves from an algorithm-based solver and then execute those moves in order. There's a lot of cool robots out there that solve Rubik's Cubes already, as we saw, but we wanted to closely examine the low-level motion planning that goes into manipulating a Rubik's Cube without all the fancy add-ons. To give you a better understanding of our setup, we decided to use a two-arm system because humans have two arms and two arms allow for greater mobility. And we put them diagonally from each other so that we can get greater coverage. Both the arms also plan independently without any collision avoidance, which surprisingly worked well enough for our task. We also welded the center of the cube and defied gravity so that we can ignore physics and focus on precisely manipulating the cube. We had a lot of goals for the project, but as expected, it was harder than anticipated. We succeeded in getting one face to turn, applying that process to other faces, rotating the cube, and our final system can do about 1.5 moves. As shown on this slide, we hard-coded four key intermediate poses. We interpolated between these poses and passed out to the inverse kinematics optimizer to get the trajectory. Um, this allowed us to be precise in our trajectory and have control over it so that we didn't knock into the cube. We also learned to get the gripper above the cube in the correct position for the same reasons. An important factor of this was also understanding what layers to fold. We had to hold exactly two layers with one gripper and one with the other to make it work. This meant that we spent a lot of time calibrating. One of the biggest challenges we ran into was gripping the cube. Because of the inertia of the cube, the gripper kept slipping when it was rotating. We tried increasing the force, but that kind of squished the tube. We tried many other approaches, and in the end, we decided to simultaneously overturn the EWA responsible for turning and turn the EWA responsible for, for holding it the other way to get a full turn. We now have the tools necessary to execute one turn. Let's see if it works. It does. The see if two works. The way we change moves together is that we pre-calculate their joint trajectories and then just join them together. As you see, this does not work. After we got one face to turn, we applied the same process to turn other faces as well. To evaluate our system, we chose the accuracy of the turns and the drift as our two metrics since our system depends on the pose of the cube. After analyzing all our moves, we found that our system has a 72% turn accuracy and an average drift of 2.4 centimeters. Some natural next steps of our system include unwalding the cube, adding gravity, fixing the sequencing of moves, maybe even exploring other ways to plan trajectories like random sampling trees and implementing some sort of feedback control for better precision. Overall, what we set out to do with the project was to really understand low-level motion planning, which we definitely have. seems consistent that we have a slippery cube. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's interesting. We have to look at that more carefully. So what surprised you the most? <laughs> Not that easy. Even the Rubik's Cube, if you think about the mechanism for the Rubik's Cube, it's actually pretty... Pretty slick mechanism. Any other questions? Okay, I think uh, yeah, a minute ago, I think Isabella's here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carolina. My partner was Marissa. We're doing a project on egg breaking, cracking eggs with inverse kinematics. Um, 
So there have been other projects that dealt with eggs, uh, such as cooking and baking. One of the most noteworthy worthy is Yoshida et al. that used one arm to crack the egg against the side of a pan and dragging the half of the shell that it was holding backwards and using the pan as a leverage point to separate the shells. Uh, in most cases, though, they disregard the process of cracking eggs by using a separate machine to either break the eggs um, entirely uh, or using pre-made mixes, which include powdered eggs. The egg breaker seeks to emulate the more intuitive way in which humans may crack eggs. A trajectory of poses through the entire motion is created with varying speeds throughout to move controllably yet create enough force to crack the egg when hit but not to crush it. The trajectory is followed by generating Iwa arm joint positions with inverse kinematics. On the left, we have our simple trajectory, which goes directly to the egg, um, but it enters at an un a non-ideal angle and doesn't allow for a nice grabbing position. On the right, we have another trajectory, but instead of following the trajectory nicely, our arms, as you can see, bounce back and forth. The egg breaker calculates the trajectory from intermediate poses and time stamps, uh, and then uses inverse kinematics to follow this trajectory. So we control this velocity of motion um, as well by uh, timing out our timestamps, um, which allows us to pick up the egg without going too fast and um, pushing it away, and uh, hit the egg um, quickly enough that uh, it breaks the egg, um, but not too fast that it crushes it entirely. Um, additionally, we're changing the angles of the grippers to pick up and empty the egg at um, different points of the trajectory. Uh, so this trajectory, um, is shown as follows here. So we start out um, by initializing it. Uh, we move directly above the egg, but not going directly to it. So that way we don't uh, crash um, the, into the egg or in the bowl, the weird angle. Then we're lowering at the le egg level. Uh, here we wait for the grippers to close around the egg um, by putting two subsequent um, positions at the same time step, or different time steps, same position, um, right in a row. Then we're raising the egg up above um, our initial uh, where the egg is located, then bring it back down to hit the egg against the table, raise the egg up again, um, and then over top of the bowl so you don't crash into the bowl, and then rotate the grippers to free the yolk and the egg whites. We've successfully commanded the trajectories and picked up the egg with both grippers simultaneously. In order to hit the egg with sufficient force against the table, we approximated the required velocity by both intuition and video analysis um, at 0.07 meters per second. Our model hits at 0.1 meters per second, which we calculated using the base of the Iwa at roughly 200 millimeters and giving the gripper two seconds to get from the top of the trajectory to the bottom. So here's our final successful attempt. Um, we follow the same trajectory as mentioned before, rotating the grippers to simulate separating the eggshell from each other. Um, our design successfully emulates a human cracking an egg with inverse kinematics. Um, this may come in handy when creating robots for human-robot interaction, as well as learning from other human processes for manipulating objects. Some areas for improvement include finding the contact forces between the egg and the table directly rather than approximating the velocities, um, as well as finding the force the force between the grippers and the eggs to make sure we were not crushing the eggs between the gripper, as well as a better egg model uh, rather than our solid egg we have right now, re representing it as two halves and also modeling the inside, the egg white and yolk. Um, so in the future, You got a lot working, that's awesome. Any questions? I wanna be a little shorter with the questions just because we're dialing into five o'clock pretty fast. Okay, let's, let's see, great work. Um, Hello, I'm Isabella and I'm going to be talking about my project on simultaneous localization and motion planning using belief-based approaches. Robots get information about the world using sensors, but real world sensors are almost often noisy as shown with the Intel RealSense depth images here. Thus, an important problem in robotics is motion planning under this uncertainty. One way of addressing this is to perform actions that maximize the information and content you get from your sensors. For example, if you're trying to get somewhere in a dark room, you might touch the walls to get information about your environment. So the question is, how can we make robots do something similar? One approach is to make trajectories accounting for the uncertainty of a robot state, or belief space planning. To make the concept of belief spaces concrete, here's an example. This is the distribution of a robot's position in a 2D world updated by a particle filter that takes in haptic information and a robot's velocity. 
notice that the distribution is quite non-Gaussian, which is important later. In terms of prior work, a common method for robot localization is the extended Kalman filter, but it's not optimal in systems with non-linear dynamics. Past work in belief space planning also assumes a Gaussian belief state and maximum likelihood observations. Thus, some questions are, how do we generalize to high-dimensional non-Gaussian states, and how do we make the algorithm filter agnostic? An idea suggested by Platt et al. in their paper, Efficient Planning in Non-Gaussian Belief Spaces, is to sample from the belief space to approximate it. Here, while the robot is not at the goal, it gets a state with maximum probability, x prime, and samples some other states from the belief space. It then creates a plan maximizing the information difference from x prime and other states, which is an optimization problem solved by quadratic programming. It then executes the plan while tracking the belief state using a histogram filter. If the belief state deviates too far from the trajectory, then we replan. To evaluate this algorithm, I set up an EWA arm facing two boxes of known positions, and we have a laser pointer um, sensing the distances to the boxes. The only unknown of this system is the position along the y-axis of the robot. And the overall goal is for the robot to localize and reach the goal position, which in this case is the middle of the gap. Applying Platt's algorithm, this is a possible trajectory we get. The robot starts off with its laser pointer at the lower box, so it generates a trajectory that detects a key feature in the environment, which is the gap, and then it goes to the gap. So overall, the algorithm is quite successful with a 93% average task completion rate. And I observed that if it starts closer to the goal, it has a higher chance of success. However, there's still some oddities in the results. If you look at the plot of the trajectory, So when I was talking about belief space planning, someone, I think Leroy asked, uh, it, do we think that trajectory optimization without all the stochastic belief space, everything is easier or harder than the belief space version? Do you feel like you had any, was the numerical optimization fairly successful or was it pretty brittle? seems like something we should figure out. Awesome. OK, I think we have an insertion here, gameplay. Hi, everyone. My name is Frank Gonzalez. And I'm Ravi Cato. And our project is on manipulating and grasping industrial tools. Nowadays, manufacturing is turning more and more towards automation using robotic systems to efficiently create high quality products. In order to support this effort, we investigated creating a system that could autonomously grasp a tool in such a way that it was ready to use. For this project, we simulated a KUKA IWA 7 arm with a general WSG gripper and two tools, a hammer and a screwdriver, to demonstrate the capabilities of our project. This plot diagram shows the overall robotic system we implemented, with the two red boxes indicating modules that were not fully integrated. For this project, we developed a stack using MASK, RCN, and ICP proposed estimation and an inverse kinematics solver for state determination. Ideally, we would use a decision maker module to choose which tool to pick up. However, with there only being two tools in this situation, the decision maker was deprioritized and thus not implemented. Regardless, the key poses were passed to slurp for generating pose trajectories. We end by passing the computed state trajectories into the simulator, and Frank will show the results from just this block, with everything else being pre-computed. In these two videos, we can see the end result of the full stack implementation, with the robotic arm navigating, grasping, and lifting the hammer on the left, and doing the same for the screwdriver on the right. 
Here, we can see a slightly different perspective on the grasps after the Iwa arm has come to rest. From these images, we can know that these are indeed usable grasps and not a random grasp on the tool, putting the system in a prime position to continue forward with whatever task it might be provided. One key pitfall we had was the mask RCNN model. The image on the left shows the top five bounding box results from our model, all of which are labeled as scissors, and many of which don't capture the full extent of the tools. This is likely due to the images we use to train the model. An example screwdriver from one of the data sets is shown on the right. The images in that data set were close cropped and rarely showed the full tools, just like the hammer handle here. It's also important to note that scissors were the most represented object in that data set as well. And this highlights the importance of finding training data representative of the expected environment. In our case, a cluttered table with most of each tool pictured. A critical next step for this project would be to generate our own training data set in the simulation. A new data set would likely give better labeling and segmentation results that could be fully used to integrate mask RCNN. Briefly touching on some of the lessons we learned throughout this project, for starters, over time, we both definitely became more comfortable working with the Drake environment. At the beginning, there was definitely some bumps along the road that made getting started pretty challenging. But once these were overcome, progress became much smoother. As for me, I learned quickly that sometimes simpler is better. I ran into several issues trying to create proper definitions for the tools, resulting in awkward physics simulations due to incorrectly defined inertials. This difficulty came from using awkwardly defined links and trying to determine the inertials myself, which didn't go well at all. The moment I switched to simple geometries, everything worked much, much better. And that summarizes up our project. Thank you for listening to our presentation. Apologies. All right. Any questions for these guys? Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering what's the difference between like a useful grasp and just like an empty table grasp? Because like I'm pretty sure like they're the same, you know, structure and feature, they just feel an empty table. I'm wondering what the difference between that and just a useful three D grasp. Awesome. Okay. Hello. My name is Oswin and I'm working with Ray Today I'll be working, uh, present our project on collaborative plot planning for multi arm manipulation of particle systems. Imagine you're a teppanyaki chef pushing around fried rice on the iron griddle to prevent it from burning. Or maybe you've chopped up carrots and you're collecting it into a pile on a cutting board. For particle systems like these, it is often difficult to find a good state representation to describe the dynamics. Instead of working with the state of each particle, one can choose to represent the state using a density image and perform um, planning directly on this density image space. This is an approach that has been done by a paper by Terry and Rest before for the case of single arm pushing. In this project, we choose to extend the single arm case to the multi arm case. Why is this interesting? First, you get squeezing behaviors, you also get sharp corners, and finally, you get inter arm collisions, leading to both arms moving to different direction. Moreover, it's difficult to generalize moreover, it's difficult to generalize single arm algorithms to the multi-arm case. Higher dimensionally action space means that there's bad scaling for action space discretization and algorithms that use sampling based optimization. And the inter-arm collisions are something that only happen in the multi-arm case and not in the single arm case. Um, so how do we solve this problem? First we use the density, density image state um, representation. Next, we design and learn dynamics directly on this density image. And finally, we use model-based RL approach, um, where we use sampling-based optimization to minimize some control of the outcome function to guarantee the controller's state stability. We have tried three different methods for learning the dynamics of our particle systems. Currently, non-learning methods, including heuristic model and the least square method works, but neural networks does not work well. The plan for heuristic model contains four parts. 
first we are given the initial state and the action commands. Then, uh, based on this states and the commands, we generate a figure mask re representing the pushed area by our heuristic function. Later, we generate a mask for waste rate allocation uh, on the area mask. And finally, we clear the pixels according to area mask and uh, reallocate these cleared weights according to a weight mask. You can see that our prediction is quite close to the ground truth. However, predicting the collision is still very difficult. All our three methods suffer here. Compared with single arm setting, collision will only happen in multi arm case. It adds nonlinearity to the dynamic and more dependency to the initial distribution. Take heuristic model as an example. If there is no particles, the pushes should not collide with each other. With particles, as the horizontal pusher pushes too much particles and those particles collide with the other pusher, it, feed, it gives a large force back to the initial pusher and uh, stop it. And this also makes the dynamic more sensitive. A slight change in distribution might result in a huge change from collision free to collision. The deep dynamic model does not work well. It does, does learn something that it should decrease the weight in the pushed area, but it does not quite understand how much it should decrease and the, where the decreased weight should be added back. On the other hand, both the non-deep methods can predict the image dynamics well. The heuristic method has a more accurate structural bias, meaning that the error is more sparse, while the least worst method here is more accurate overall with smaller errors in magnitude. Finally, we combine both dynamics, um, both working dynamics models with soundly-based optimization from the Terry and Russ's paper and successfully um, synthesize a controller that can push particles into the target surface set. Surprisingly, despite the much larger action space compared to a single arm case, we still obtain a stabilizing controller using both non-deep dynamics models. In conclusion, the basic problem of learning general dynamics is too hard to solve and it's not necessary to fully solve it for planning. To deal with it. Was that, that, oh, I see, that was not your end. Okay, nice. So, so what's the conclusion? Would you, would you stay away from deep going forward or do you think uh, you, the deep? I see. Nicely said. Okay, we have four left. If you guys are willing to stick with us, we're gonna get everybody in. Yeah, four left, assuming everybody's here. Uh, thank you guys for your patience and I, 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 I'm loving it, so. See if I can avoid blasting YouTube. All right. Yes, we learned about some powerful techniques in motion planning, including kinematic trajectory optimization. As we discussed, however, they often tend to avoid collisions too conservatively. In addition, real-world tasks frequently have multiple potential solutions. In this project, we take inspiration from cognitive science models of how humans plan and make decisions and explore how we can obtain robot trajectories that are good or more precisely near optimal and that also take varying approaches to traversing the environment. My name is Yavana. And my friend Stewie and I are going to present our project on Marco Chain Monte Carlo, in short MCMC, motion planning for Boltzmann Rational Trajectory Optimization. In this project, we implement five MCMC algorithms of zero, first, and second order, and combine random sampling and optimization to generate good and diverse trajectories. We evaluate the trajectories and perform ablation studies on 2D navigation and 3D manipulation problems. We show that zeroth and first order methods prove as sufficient for 2D problems and that solving 3D manipulation tasks benefits from second order derivatives. Finally, we suggest that our MCMC motion planners may be a helpful way for robots to model humans. Next, we discuss what we learned and our process of getting there. 
We learned that Markov chain Monte Carlo is quite a powerful method for generating samples from desired distributions. Indeed, even for the simplest of the algorithms that uses no derivative information, we were able to obtain a surprising amount of viable trajectories. We experienced how defining the cost function for the problem can be difficult, and for just a small change in how we penalize obstacle collision compared to the length of trajectory, we observed trajectories going straight through the obstacles and away from the goal. We compared the algorithms with respect to their time complexity and the kind of trajectories they generate, and we found that for 2D environments, unadjusted Langevin algorithm requires least tuning to generate diverse obstacle avoiding trajectories. We learned that sampling from a Boltzmann distribution, which is commonly used to model human decision making, allows the trajectories to explore multiple potential solutions. And as would make sense intuitively, we found that the variance of the path scales nicely with the number of obstacles. The beta parameter of the Boltzmann distribution, commonly referred to as the rationality coefficient, intuitively corresponds to how strong is the preference for low cost trajectories. Next, we performed experiments on a 3D manipulation environment involving motion planning to a desired pose of a seven degree of freedom robotic arm. Um, here we compare uh, two trajectories sampled from Newtonian Monte Carlo, a second order method uh, with beta equals 0 0.1 um, and beta equals 10. We can see that for beta equals 0 0.1, there's quite a bit of shaking and suboptimality. While for beta equals 10, uh, we see a smooth interpolation to the desired final pose. Uh, we also compare it to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, a first order algorithm that's uh, widely considered as the gold standard for MCMC uh, with beta equals 10. And we observed that there's quite a bit of wild oscillation. This is consistent with our quantitative results, which show that uh, for this 3D motion planning problem, only the second order algorithms are able to optimize well enough to discover low cost trajectories. Uh, at the same time, Newtonian Monte Carlo also produces the most diverse trajectories and therefore uh, does the best at generating diverse and near optimal trajectories. Um, in this project, we successfully used MCMC algorithms to produce diverse and approximately optimal trajectories for motion planning problems. Uh, we also consider several directions for future work. Most importantly is a more complete evaluation with more diverse and complex experimental environments. Um, second, uh, in handling constraints, we perform a projection step, which causes us to lose the technical condition of reversibility and theoretical convergence. It would be interesting to see how we could restore these with more advanced methods. Uh, lastly, the direction that we are most excited about is in our using our motion planning algorithms for Bayesian trajectory prediction and human robot collaboration problems. Uh, thank you for listening to our presentation and we hope you enjoy. I chopped one second. I, I apologize. That was super clear. Thank you. The, the, so the it was joint space <clears throat> in the 3D examples that you're planning in, right? So the jump from the 2D examples to the 3D examples was actually a jump from two degrees of freedom to like seven degrees of freedom. Yeah. yeah. Nice. No, that was really really well articulated. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, Tom's been waiting here. Here we go. Hi, my name is Tom, and today I'm excited to present my final project for robotic manipulation on augmenting ICP using dense object nets with applications in surgical robot perception. State-of-the-art robots for vascular surgery offer minimal autonomy. Surgeons maintain direct control over wire-based surgical manipulators, and many surgeons are deterred by the associated learning curve. A major obstacle to higher autonomy surgical manipulators is developing highly robust simultaneous localization and mapping. Ultrasound is the primary imaging modality utilized, and we are interested in developing a SLAM algorithm capable of mapping an unknown vessel geometry in vivo. ICP is a common front-end algorithm used in acoustically based SLAM. However, as we learned in class, ICP is susceptible to convergence to local minima in the case of poor initialization or minimal point cloud saliency. 
Intraoperative ultrasound suffers from both these issues, though exploitation of 3D priors from preoperative imaging has the potential to improve ICP performance. Therefore, I propose the use of contrastive correspondence learning between adjacent depth images simulated from a prior CT mesh. These correspondences will be used to inform registration tasks on real ultrasound point clouds representing successive poses of the robot. Prior to intervention, the surgeon would run the following data generation pipeline. First, we select a random pose inside the preoperative CT scan to represent the surgical end effector and generate an offset pose to simulate motion of the optical frame. We utilize a combination of ray casting and an inverse pinhole model to generate simulated depth images and ground truth pixel-wise correspondences. This data set is then fed to a dense object network, which is a similar framework to what we learned about in class. Finally, we calculate pixel-wise loss in the descriptor space, given knowledge of ground truth correspondences. To illustrate quantitative results, first I show the pixel-wise correspondence precision. The network did not perform as well as the original architecture proposed by Florence, likely because we were working with sparser depth images in comparison to rich RGB information. It was noticed that when the probe views surfaces from far away, interesting structures like vessel subbranches and significant variations in curvature are evident from depth images. Therefore, in future work, it may be possible to apply a larger weighting to high intensity depth values in the pixel wise loss function. Here I demonstrate the registration performance for vanilla ICP and network augmented ICP across 40 point cloud pairs. Don ICP had a lower inlier error average. The variations were not found to be statistically significant. To explore underlying factors for this, I'll now discuss some qualitative registration results. So the big money question is, does it work for the, does it help solve the global correspondence problem? Oh, yeah. Awesome. I'm glad it worked. Okay. Last two, taking it home, here we go. Hi, we're Martin, Fiona, and Hannah, and we're presenting our final presentation on scooping for 64210 fall 2022 robotic manipulation. As with DexAI Robotics Alfred, which we talked about in class, they use a trajectory optimization scooping technique. Um, however, besides some niche applications of scooping in industry, there's little academic work in scooping. Um, best we could find was scooping with a flat spatula off of a flat surface, um, whereas we're going to be exploring scooping with a convex tool. Um, and based off of all of like the previous uh, research, as well as some previous conversations with Russ, we decided to try and pursue a pre-compute then choose approach, um, where we pre-compute appropriate trajectories for different pin states, uh, such as empty, half full, and full, then use perception to try and determine which trajectory to select. Um, and so this is the direction that we eventually hope to take this project, um, although we did not quite finish pursuing the perception selection process. The first part of our project was setting up a scooping environment. Um, it's pretty similar to the bin picking setup, but the main difference with our EWA arm setup is that there's a measuring cup that we have welded onto the end of the EWA. In addition, we are using spheres instead of bricks for collision geometry. Um, and this is because they're way easier to simulate and we were running into significant issues with our simulation speed, even after we updated to use the SAP contact solver, which is faster than the default MeshCat contact solver. Um, and actually the simulation speed constraint becomes a pretty strong constraint for how we thought about the granularity of our poses in the future. We pursued two approaches in parallel and the first one was our geometric scooping. This is adapted from the robot painter notebook that we saw in class. And the key idea here is we're using simple geometries to plan the motion of scooping from one bin and pouring into the other. So for the scoop trajectory, we started with a circle, but it was really hard to balance getting deep into the bin and also being able to turn the scoop upright at the end. So we ended up using an ellipse to have more control over both the width and depth of the scoop. For the pouring, this motion was less constrained since we're starting out of the bin and then moving the objects in so we could still use a circular path. For our other approach, um, we went for a teleop record. And so the idea was um, if we could scoop successfully using teleop, we can save those trajectories and use them back later. So this is um, two steps, one recording and then two playback. Um, for recording, it was pretty straightforward because we um, tried to set up a good interface for us to um, record with. So it was pretty much telling off the robot as you would usually, and then um, 
when you're done, you would press the the save poses button and it would save it all to file. Um, from a user standpoint, you know, pretty easy. Um, but, you know, behind the scenes, we had to put in like quite a lot to um, make it happen. Um, and the way that we had the poses saved was we used a file representation of a file with basically one pose for each line, where each pose is represented by a six tuple. Um, you have rotation for three of the numbers and then XYZ for the other. Um, they're not like perfect descriptors, but they work when you're trying to just get from one pose to the other for like the longest of poses. Um, so teleop record playback. Um, the main components to using the teleop record for a future automatic playback are in cleaning up the teleop path, reading the files that they're stored in, and actually moving the EWA arm based on the information that we've read. So a single trajectory file will usually hold an ordered list of desired poses, and there's often more than a few unnecessary positions within this file, um, just because of the nature of teleop. And so some manual cleaning is sometimes desired. Um, in addition, uh, deleting and adjusting poses can sometimes help with resolving issues from the EWA getting stuck or having joints that are fully extended. Um, and we parse these cleaned files to create paths based on the movements between poses rather than the positions themselves. Um, and then the EWA can then be directed to execute these movements. Now we'll talk a little bit more about our results. So here we have a video of a full scooping and pouring path with our 50 simulated spheres. So we sped this video up by five times because as you can see, there's a big slowdown when the scoop starts interacting with the spheres. And with this trajectory, we also tend to have to push some spheres out of the bin, but we can reliably pick up three spheres every time. After the scoop, we have an intermediate frame to make sure the scoop stays um, upright so we don't drop the spheres we just picked up. And then finally, we move on to pouring into the other bin. Both approaches yielded successful scooping and pouring results. While the geometric approach created relatively smooth trajectories, it proved difficult to navigate the bin environment and plan what geometric shapes would work best. The teleop approach creates much more flexibility and can quickly plan trajectories to new situations, but maybe a little bit less smooth. So some of the challenges uh, along the way and lessons we learned. Um, we found that even though you know, this is a robotics class, a lot of the stuff we did to help us out would actually um, just like good software development sort of deal. And some future work um, is that we we settled on our scooper early on, but it's actually not the best scooper for scooping. Um, the walls are actually pretty high on the scooper, so it's tough to get it to go into a bin full of spheres. And also, we didn't get to um, automatically choose the trajectories through perception. Uh, there's also room for trajectory optimization. Um, the trajectories you get are ultimately as good as the trajectories that you can tell you have yourself. Part of that is probably like making a cost function for scoops. Um, not sure if this is something for Drake or something for um, users of Drake. But Speaking of that simulation should um, make things better. But yeah, that's our scooping projects. So, um, you know, it was tough. We learned a lot. Thanks for watching. Awesome. I can definitely help you speed it up. If you want. If you care, we can speed it up. Okay. Ryan looks he's ready. He's, all right. And thanks for joining us today. So Garden Buddy is a robot arm that controls some unfamiliar hose in an unfamiliar garden. The information here is unknown beforehand to the robot arm, and so the speed of the water is unknown and location of the plants is unknown. Here's a little demonstration that we'll um, you know, dive deeper into later in this presentation. So the two main components of the project, there's a perception side, which is exploring this unknown environment, and there's a motion planning side, which is commanding the robot, uh, planning the trajectory, and tuning the controllers. So here's the overall approach. So we start by getting the perception, um, and then the perception component, the module, passes on the information to pose optimization, which passes on the information to the interpolation module, which goes to the IK module, and then the controller module, and this is a closed loop. So we begin with the perception component, which takes in the scene and needs to find the target plant locations as well as the droplet speed. To find the plant positions, we use our RGBD sensor to get a depth image and then filter for pixels with lower depth as those represent the plants excluding the EWA controller. And once we get this filtered depth image, we perform a graph search to find the clusters, which represent the plants, as well as the center plants, which represents our target locations. Shown here. To find the droplet launch speed, we begin by executing a sequence where the robot launches droplets horizontally. And then using kinematics, knowing the height of the robot, we just need to find the average location of where the droplets land. To do so, we take our, a sequence of five color images taken 0.1 seconds apart 
and compute the difference between them to find the motion of the droplets. And then we perform a convolution and filter to remove any other noise from motion, leaving just the droplets. And thus we can find the average location and using inverse kinematics, find the, the speed. And feeding this into the motion plane as, long as, as well as the plant locations. The positions of the potted plants and the speed at which droplets leave the hose, we want to find the optimal poses for the dripper to be in, such that water coming out of the hose reaches the potted plants. We do this by solving a constrained optimization problem using mathematical program. We want to find a pose that's very close to the one the robot is currently in, but such that water droplets coming out of it intersect with the z height of the potted plant in the same x and y position as where the plant actually is. So we do this by using the equations of projectile motion that we've seen in 801. We find the time, t star, at which the droplet reaches the correct z height, and then we find the positions x star and y star where that happens. So we constrain our optimization problem for the error cost to be the difference between the, the candidate pose and the current pose, and we set the constraint that the x and y position of the landing is the same as the position of the potted plant. Sequence of poses to a smooth sequence of keyframe poses for a robot to follow. Currently we move from pose to pose directly. This leads to jerky movement and also means that our robot does not stay on one plant long enough for the plant to be watered fully. We propose a solution where we interpolate with two more segments in between. We first move to a comfortable Z height where the robot does not have to move through itself to get from one pose to another. And after the second segment, we aim to be at the goal pose. We spend the third segment at the goal pose so that the plant is watered fully. This three-part solution leads to a smoother trajectory which leads to good results. We pass this as a piecewise pose trajectory into inverse kinematics so that we can convert these into joint angles. Here's an example of the pose optimization actually working and you can see the frames um, and the robot snapping to the frames. So for the in inverse kinematics we use the IK solver manually and this allows us to go from desired poses to the joint angles and we update these every 0.1 seconds. Here without any optimization on anything you can see that the robot just jerks around and the trajectory is not optimized at all. For the controller we decided to use the inverse dynamics controller um, this allows us to go from, to jo from joint angles to the forces that we need. Uh, the inverse dynamics controller specifically allows us for bigger time steps, and it'll, it allows us to tune the PID gains manually. Here's the whole simulation being run, and this is a whole closed loop. So you see that the, uh, the water shoots horizontally, which allows us to get the speed, and then we can shoot the plants knowing the speed. And this entire simulation is a closed loop, so the robot doesn't know anything. Um, the camera gives this information, and then the robot can know where to go from there. Thanks for watching our presentation, and here's a link to the deep note. Apart from Pi virtual display, what was the hardest part? That was weird, okay. Uh, vector optimization of three digits. Uh, so we wanted to use kinematics to find the average location of that three digit thing. Uh, or we can do it like in sequence of positions of those things, which is how we always end up finding the best three digits. So we just like kind of vector the digits by X, Y, Z, because we can't like really get into those details. Um, other than that, we found that the order from which we make the vector switches to kinematics is pretty good. Right? <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, everybody, for an awesome semester. That was really, really, really fun. And for those of you that stuck in here the whole time, that's awesome. I'm happy to stick around for a little bit, but uh, yeah.